blah, blah, blah. Government code 549957. Ratifies workers' compensation claims <laughs> okay, now for the Pledge of Allegiance, Rosa Lee. Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to everyone that's here, and we're so happy to have you here with us. <laughs> este Virginia está ahí, y si necesitas uh, un traductor, se puede pedir los aparatos con ella. <laughs> este, now, we're going to have Dr. Rodriguez and Superintendent comments. Yes, thank you. Um, so PVUSD has the first computer science immersion school in Santa Cruz County. And we had our second epic build at Valencia Elementary this past week. Students grades kindergarten, so as young as kindergarten to sixth grade, worked on projects with Lego robotics. So in a moment, after I say this in Spanish, we're going to show you a short video for you to enjoy. So nuestro distrito escolar tiene la primera escuela de inmersión en ciencias de computación en el condado de Santa Cruz. Tuvimos nuestro segundo evento of Epic Build en la escuela Valencia la semana pasada. Los estudiantes de kinder hasta sexto grado trabajaron en proyectos de, ro de robótica con Legos. Y aquí hay un breve video para que Make it bigger. <laughs> Look 
you can see here is you're seeing that they programmed Lego Robotics to go around um, the pathway. Here you see the student actually explaining to his father um, what he did on the computer to code it um, to be able to do what it did. So lo que vieron en el video es vieron lo que hicieron es y tuvieron que hacer la computación para que la máquina de Legos um, siguieron el camino y después puede ver el niño que está enseñando a su papá lo que hizo en la computadora para hacer la um, codificación. Um, so next week we will be on spray break. So I hope everybody enjoys the rest and has a safe time off. We look forward to seeing all of our students and staff back at work on Monday, April 8th, 2019. So you don't get more than a week, just one week off. La próxima semana vamos a estar en vacaciones de primavera. Espero que todos disfruten de un descanso seguro. Esperamos volver a verles de regreso en las escuelas y en el trabajo el lunes um, 8 de abril. So todos solamente reciben una semana ni un día más. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, now for governing board comments, and I will start with Jennifer Schachter. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I was able to visit H.A. Hyde, um, and get a tour of the school. Um, they do have a lot of special needs students there. So it was wonderful to see all the students and the teachers, and they all wanted me to show, show me what they were working on. So it was a good visit and a, and a productive visit. We also have a food services um, meeting tomorrow where we're talking about uh, different items. Um, with the school dress sticks, it's been mentioned before that we are trying to be more green. Um, it's also been mentioned about the nutrition. Um, value of some of the meals, and that's all going to be talked about, um, and we're going to be giving a tour of the nutrition facilities. Um, and I was also able to attend Zumba with our mayor of Watsonville, which was a fun community event. Um, lots of community members were out there, a chance to socialize and, and talk a little bit, and lots more things on the upcoming agenda that I look forward to. Thank you. I have mostly lost my voice. So we'll see how well this goes. Um, I was able to do site visits to Renaissance High School and to uh, Rio Del Mar Elementary, and like getting to see you know our schools, you know from a school board trustee perspective was very empowering. And just looking at what our schools are capable of and you know where they can grow and develop is is um, I'm proud of the work that they're doing. And just you know on a personal note, I just I wanted to say that Bobby Salazar um, was someone for whom I had a great deal of admiration. I'll, I'll talk about him just for a second. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, I'll talk about him all the comment then. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. So it's been a couple of busy weeks for us. Um, last week, I participated in our educational equity uh, blueprint report. Um, and at this session, we received various reports, including one on student-led conferences, NCT pathways. I'm very excited about the possibility of expanding student-led conferences to schools, to other schools within our district as a way to increase not only parent involvement, um, but also uh, students' ownership of their own work and success, development of their leadership skills, and goal setting. I'm also already, uh, very excited about the Amy Helm CTE programs and the integration of CTE pathways at the middle school level. At our last board meeting, I mentioned the concern that I, I had, along with DLAC parents, um, who had expressed concerns around MAP scores and not all uh, parents receiving their MAP scores and needing um, additional help uh, really deciphering what those scores meant for their students. So I'm really excited to announce that starting next year, the, our district will be implementing the following. We will be printing MAP scores in-house and handing them out during parent-teacher conferences um, and back to school nights. We will, preparing, we will be preparing a list of questions parents can ask teachers regarding the assessment scores for their students and having Ann Childers visit more classrooms and work with goal setting uh, around MAP scores with both students and teachers at the elementary schools. And a couple of other things. 
And if the board approves to deny the following item, we will be paying for the MAP assessment tool for um, our dependent charter schools. I also attended our monthly DLAC meeting. At this meeting, our parents received a report on uh, our Pajaro Valley High School Field Project and a report on the recommendations of safe routes to school plan for three of our schools, including Minty White, Watsonville High School, and Pajaro Valley High. And in an effort to keep our board meeting shorter, I have began working with our superintendent to move our student recognitions to the Mellow Center. So making that an annual celebration where we recognize all students at once and I think it will be a better experience for them where they can invite their families and even their friends. Um, more of a celebra celebration, that's, that's I think what we wanna get out of moving it uh, to an annual event. And lastly, I would like to um, invite everyone to join us tom tomorrow at the Cesar Chavez Leadership Community Awards. Isabel Tunser, uh, who has brought El Sistema to Paro Valley Unified School District, will be honored at this event. So I'm hoping that some of you can show your support tomorrow night. Thank you. Rosalie. <coughs> so, hello everyone. I was in talk with the Aptal Sai principal and we were discussing the national model for school counseling program and how it's doing at Aptal Sai. From what we've seen, the model really has been adapting well into our school. Our counselors are working effectively with one another along with parents and students to further create an environment that best promotes student achievement. While talking to the ASB class of Pajaro Valley High School, it was great to see that they really have seen a positive change as well. The students have mentioned that it was very nice to see their counselors individually calling seniors into their office in order to in order to go over their academic plans for the future and calling students in in general to make sure that they're on track to accomplish everything they need by the end of the year. Though counselors are doing a great job at meeting with students, they of course can't get to everyone as quickly as many students hope. Watson Hill High students, for example, have expressed that it does take a while for some of their students to meet with their counselors. One example is that of a senior who needed help with, from his counselor in order to apply to the Carrillo's Honors Program, and when he went, went to go reach out to his counselor, he was informed that it would take over a week to meet with them. It, it was also the Watson Hill High students who I spoke with that said when they do have time to meet with their counselors, they feel like their conversations are a bit rushed in order so their counselors can move on to other students. So I believe that counseling process has gotten a bit better throughout the years, but of course there's still more to do in order to ensure that all students are properly taken care of throughout all the high schools. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Perla. I mean, you're not Perla, you're Rosalie, I'm sorry. I called you last year's. That was last year's. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've been very busy with um, a family event the past two weeks, and every Thursday and Saturday you'll find me out at the track watching my daughter, who's a senior, uh, run her events. Um, she's running in the Stanford Invitational this Saturday, which um, is a prestigious event with all the college coaches there. So we're lo really looking forward to that. <laughs> um, and we're uh, actually preparing and getting really um, quite excited for graduation. And I know all the seniors are um, have senioritis, I think. They're, um, they're working hard to keep their grades up, but it's also a time when they're sort of feeling like they're done with the high school situation. So I wish all the seniors um, all the best in the last few weeks of school and hang in there for the teachers and staff. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. City of Watsonville, PBUSD. Uh, just a couple things. I've been active in the community school district. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was with the mayor. We cleaned up the levee with the Buddhist temple. Um, last Saturday, me and Council Member Aurelia, we fixed up some of the baseball fields at EA Hall. Um, recently, I have attended a school site council meeting at Minnie White where the, the Minnie White has been working with the city and the school district, so we're working on fixing the streets on Lincoln. I live on Lincoln. I'm pretty sure that some parents live right here on Lincoln. Um, very dangerous all the way up Lincoln from the high school all the way up to Freedom. And also at that same meeting, we talked about getting those portables fixed up. Um, I know uh, Minnie White has spent some money already, so we'll help with the remaining money 
we could get new portables. Those portables have been there since I was there, and hopefully we can work on getting those portables fixed up. Thank you very much. So hi, I'm Karen. Um, I went to DLAC, but I also um, went to another staff meeting at Hall School with all the teachers. And I had reported to you last time what it was like when we went to Pajaro Middle School, and it was like that. <laughs> it was like Pajaro Middle School with all the um, discussion about you know what Michelle Michelle was there of course Miss Dr Rodriguez excuse me and um, what sh what they're doing in 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 the schools and w what we're accomplishing and then um, teachers got to go around to different posters to talk about different items such as integrity empowerment. Um, Integrity, excellence, what? Equity, Equity. <laughs> all these posters all around the room and, and put their comments on them. And of course, um, she opened it up for questions and then she offered everyone that wasn't able to have their question answered that she would, and they, they all had their three by five cards, and she would answer them on her weekend their questions, and which she has done for the Pato Middle School S teachers. They feel really good about it, and so she's gonna do for it. Um, I also decided to go <laughs> with Migrant Head Start. I actually went to meet the new uh, providers um, for our daycare homes. Um, we we're hoping to get four more new providers, and so we went to all of their homes and checked out what they have done in terms of, um, you know, in, s in some cases they didn't have all the toys and everything there yet, but we were able to see their space and what it looked like and where the bathroom was right next door and where they're gonna, p where th their outside facilities were and, you know, s some of them were ready to go. One of them was totally ready to go and she, and it was a really wonderful place, absolutely great. So all the, all the providers, the new providers had really nice homes and we felt good about um, having them be our new providers. And they're all getting, they're all um, going to training and they all, they're, they're all getting their licenses, um, which they have to show that they have, you know, the classes and, um, and the training in order to do what they're doing, which is pretty impressive. Uh, thanks. <coughs> Now I'm gonna go, I'm gonna um, talk about someone who has passed, someone who is very, very special to me and to countless, countless others. His name is Bobby Salazar. He, um, he lived at Aptos High and he worked as a lead custodian for 42 years. 42 years. And he was put in the Hall of Fame in 2010, and he's been Mariner of the Month more than once. He was our CSEA president for five years, and he was always, always at our board meetings. He was always here. Um, he's, he's done so many other things, I'm not gonna be able to name them all, but he, he has been on the site council. He's been in the home and school club. He sh he's chaperoned all kinds of field trips. He even gave in services on gangs. He actually sang in the school assemblies. <laughs> he was even a coach. You know, we should probably figure out how to name something after him, you know, at some point <coughs> at Aptos. We should probably name something after Bobby. I think we should probably do that and go ahead and talk about how wonderful he is to your children. <laughs> so Bobby always made me fit, when I was a head student you know, at Aptos High, he made me feel welcome as a parent, but what was most important was that he, my kids felt like they had somebody looking out for them in Bobby. And he was just, he fell naturally into friendliness. It, friendship was his natural state. 
Um, my older children were, were just so incredibly saddened to hear of his passing, and, and so was I. Um, I I'm going to greatly, you know, my, I've got a younger child who will eventually go on to have Tusk, and it makes me sad that I won't see um, Bobby's smile in a way that was a part of Aftos High for me. He actually counseled many students as a head custodian, but students came to him and asked him for advice. I mean, you know, like he was there for every student. It was pretty amazing. So I'm going to have us take a moment to honor Bobby, just a moment to honor Bobby. Thank you. Oh, you want to say something yeah. too? <laughs> okay. I just want to let the public know that there'll be services this Friday, I believe, at Mel's Chapel at 1 to 3, and a celebration of his life at Aptos, I believe, at 11 a.m. So if, if anybody would like to come and say thank you. Uh, yeah, Aptos, yeah, Aptos High School, she, people should try to go to Aptos High at 11 a.m. And the date is? This, this coming Saturday, if you can make it to Aptos High to honor Bobby, that would be really great. As many of you that can go, go there. Okay, now we have high school students board report and, oh, and we have a new school student. That's what we have here tonight, a new school student. Hmm? Students, you have new school students. So you can go up to the microphone if you want, if you want to. And name yourselves. Okay. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Christopher Lopez, and this is... And I'm Karina. Uh, today we will be representing the school community day. Uh, recently we received a new counselor. Her name is Stephanie. Um, she transferred from PVPSA, and I actually really like her and enjoy her uh, being at our school, seeing how um, she helps a lot of kids emotionally and um, academically, such as scholarships. So recently, uh, New School developed a new schedule format. So um, now instead of having our period to after break, we have it before. And then our lunch has been moved um, after our fourth period, just because um, we wanted our lunch lady to come back, but she wasn't able to assist us at the time that we had because she was busy attending with uh, the PV High kids. So that's um, that was our last um, schedule. So now some of the classes have changed times and on Wednesdays, it's uh, we we have it different. We have um, our lunch is at the end of the school day. Um, so food wet is oh, wow. um, something that Karina and I are in, and we really enjoy it because there we learn about um, nutrients and like health benefits. Um, and today we actually went and we sharpened shovels, and we learned about cooking rice, like brown rice, and like the difference what it is between brown rice and white rice. So we also recently had, um, earlier this March, we had a field trip to Año Nuevo State Park, where we were able to visit like the elephant seals and our students were able to learn different types of facts about them, such as um, how the longest an elephant seal has been able to hold their breath underwater was two hours and 20 minutes. And we were able to see them in like little groups. So by that time, the, during March, is when like the pups are the ones that are left and the moms and the dads are, have left them already on the beach. So we saw like a couple of them Unfortunately, we saw one that was um, like dead next to like uh, the dad, but um, we really had a good time even though the weather wasn't so great. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So recently we also um, started um, our applications for our new outdoor science and character development program. And the theme around this is going to be um, ocean life. So um, it's going to begin after spring break, which is going to be the first Thursday. And our first field trip is going to be to Growing Up Wild, where we will just get like established with all the stuff that we will be able to do later in our field trips. And yeah, basically that would be it. And we would um, update you guys later on the other field trips that we would have. Um, so we just finished our basketball season. Uh, they were competing, their last um, game was competing with Sequoia and they actually were victorious. And this time they did a, a bet again with Mr. Love. And here's a clip of them shaving his head. <laughs> so our next sport is gonna be soccer. Um, this two will also be starting, I think, after spring break, and right now they're having practice. Um, the practice, of course, will be during the week, um, in the mornings, and then games would be like uh, um, the Fridays. And the students there who are playing would be able to receive uh, PE credits. Uh, so currently we're working on the yearbook. Um, it's still in progress because we're confused about um, the images that we're going to put on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we're planning of uh, putting a school picture like of every student. Um, I believe in the front page. Yes. Yeah. Um, and what's really great is that um, they're only ten dollars. So yeah. Good price. So for diplomas in caps and gowns, our office manager, the um, Olga, who's in charge of um, every student's transcript, she, after spring break, she'll be ordering our, our caps and gowns and diplomas. And right now she's just seeing, like, who, um, trying to understand who, what kids will finish and what kids won't, unfortunately. So she can have, like, an estimate about how many of those things she will order. Um, so our math teacher, um, Ms. Jones, made this um, slideshow called um, Social Skills at New School. Um, it, she's teaching us about um, having confidence and maintaining stress, um, developing emotional intelligence, and doing problem solving. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna do student recognition. We were just talking about we're doing a big one at one point next year. Is the McQuitty person here? Is there someone from Watsonville High School that's here? Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna put McQuitty Elementary at the end because I've been told that they're a little bit late. Right Are they here? here? Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, I'll put you second. <laughs> nice to see you, I'm really glad you're here. Okay, I'm gonna do um, Fatima Gonzalez Solis Ohlone Elementary. Natalie. Okay, good evening, President Osmondson, Dr. Rodriguez, and members of the board. 
I'm Dr. Jean Gottlow, principal of Ohlone Elementary, and I'm very proud to be here with some very important members of our team. We have our academic coordinator, Gina Elizalde, and Fatima's teacher, Candelaria Suniga. And we are very pleased to present Fatima Gonzalez Solis as our Ohlone Elementary Student of the Year. She is here with her mom, Maria Cristina Solis, her dad, Jose Alfredo Gonzalez, and her siblings, Jose Enrique and Natalie. Fatima has attended Ohlone Elementary School since kindergarten and has always been an outstanding student. She is a math superstar and a talented, expressive writer who loves to read and she sets her own ambitious personal reading goals. Not only is Fatima an excellent student, but she is also a great friend and classmate. She is organized, generous, compassionate, and always eager to lend a helping hand. We asked Fatima's classmates to describe her, and they all mentioned how caring she is and how she goes out of her way to help others. They also spoke about how helpful she is, her determination, creativity, and sense of humor. She is truly an extraordinary girl. Fatima's family and friends encourage her to do her best, and that is exactly what she does. Fatima herself recognizes that she is someone who doesn't give up without a fight. Congratulations, Fatima. We know you will keep on fighting, and we are proud to have you represent our school. I could have been one. I was not. <laughs> it's so wonderful that you are, and you're such a great reader, too. Thank you. Luis Marquez, McQuitty Elementary. Good evening, President Osmussen, Dr. Rodriguez, members of the board. It's an honor and a privilege to present to you this exceptional Mustang student, Luis Marquez. Ms. Chappelle, his classroom teacher, has a few words. Um, at McQuitty, we're very proud to announce him as our student of the year. He, um, he's an amazing kid that he exemplifies what it means to be a McQuitty Mustang, and he's definitely somebody to be looked up to because of his dedication to his education and his positive peer relationships, and he continues to prove himself as a responsible, trustworthy, dedicated, kind-hearted, and compassionate individual at McQuitty. These are the words that the class came up with. I'm like, how would you describe him? And that's everything they said. He's participated in student leadership the past two years, in this role, he's shown us that he has exceptional public speaking skills and a strong sense of fairness. 
Louise cares so much about McQuitty and has brought many thoughtful ideas on how we can make it a better and safer place for all of us to learn and grow. He's participated in Mustang athletes for three years, playing kickball, soccer, and football. And as a skilled athlete, he exemplifies great sportsmanship by always encouraging and including others. Um, he's extremely outgoing and definitely multi-talented because he was the Grinch in fourth grade at our winter performance and he nailed it. Um, he's aspiring to, um, he's aspiring to be an engineer when he grows up because he wants to work with his two brothers in the same field. And we're just really proud of him and he's very deserving and he's a wonderful role model and we just can't wait to see what a great person he becomes as an adult. So congratulations, buddy. I'd like to just take a moment to introduce the rest of the folks that are here. His father, Luis, his mother, Ava, his older brother, Daniel, who was a McQuitty Mustang too, as early as last year, <laughs> and oh. Miss Cesarello, our academic coordinator. So thank you. The last one that we have here tonight is Ana Sanchez, Diamond Technology Institute. So good evening, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I am extremely excited to be standing here with Anna's support team, her mom, Rosalia, uh, her sister, Rosa, who I had in my English class when I taught at Watsonville High School, Octavio, Guadalupe, Eliberto, uh, Michaela, Luz, Juan, and Maria. Um, I know that Anna's support team is strong, and I knew it the second she came to my school as an eighth grader and said, I want to be here and I want to be an engineer. She has never wavered from that um, since I've known her. But the first two years of her schooling with us, she definitely <laughs> was stuck on petroleum engineer. Um, but recently, she has decided that she has an affinity for computer science and she's taking a class at Cabrillo in computer science as well, so she's dual enrolled. Anna is the top of her class of 2020. She volunteers at the public library as a tutor. She volunteers at the science workshop. Um, I can't say enough amazing things about Anna and do not let her quiet and shy demeanor fool you. She is a white tiger through and through. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're, we couldn't be prouder to present Anna tonight as our student of the year and we know that she's dedicated to educational improvement and she's dedicated to her school and community and we know that she's gonna go far no matter if it's in engineering or computer science. Good job, Anna. Congratulations. <laughs> and I think she wants to say a little, uh, just a couple things. Hello, my name is Anna Sanchez, and I would like to invite everyone to the business board tomorrow between 9 to 1 at the Mail Center. This is for our junior class and senior class. We will, we will present our business project and also think short, tank without a short, and I would like to <laughs> and I would like to thank my mom, especially. Um, I would like to thank my family, especially my mom, for their support in my education.
Next, <laughs> okay, all the, all the kids can go. <laughs> all the awardees. Okay, so next I'm very proud to um, give to Todd Gill, <laughs> our excellent reporter, who is a good friend of mine, and I'll obviously I've known him for my 14 and a half years here. He is receiving the CSBA Golden Quill Award recognizing outstanding education journalism. And Maria is going to say a few more things. She helped nominate, nominate him. Yeah, so Todd was actually selected as one of 25 recipients of the Golden Quill Award. Um, this award is presented in recognition of fair, insightful, and accurate reporting on public school news by print, uh, broadcast, and online news media representatives. The Niagara Golden Quill Awards are presented by the California School Board Association to recognize outstanding education journalism and highlight the essential role journalists play in increasing understanding of the objectives, operations, accomplishments, challenges, and opportunities related to public schools. Todd Gill is honored by PBUSD for his ongoing coverage of the Paro Valley High School athletic field. From the time the district reached an agreement with the Watsonville Pilots Association in September of 2017 to announce him when the Planning Commission would vote on the project in April 2018, to the announcement of the field's groundbreaking ceremony in February of this year, Todd Gill has Please been please. with PBUSD documenting these historic achievements. As a board, we want to acknowledge Todd Gill for his many years of service to our school district. He has been instrumental in keeping our constituents abreast of the many initiatives we have introduced, our accomplishments as a district, as well as the challenges we have faced. Congratulations, Todd. You want to come to the podium? And uh, we should. Well, thank you. It's with great appreciation. Um, showing up really matters, and you show up here repeatedly. We thank you for that because I know sometimes these board meetings are dry, and we appreciate your fair and accurate reporting on things. <laughs> we used to have a reporter, um, Donna Brown. Was her name Donna Brown? Jones. Jones. Donna Jones, who used to also 
um, be here. And she was tough on us. She asked us a lot of very tough questions and would do a lot of investigative probing um, reports and wasn't always, um, sh didn't always shine uh, Pajaro Valley in, in a very favorable light. I think sometimes Sentinel potentially has people watching from afar and then reporting on things later. But I think this face-to-face -face, um, relationship uh, matters. And um, I just want to thank you for being here. We really appreciate your, um, your presence, your reporting, and we thank the um, Pajaronian. And you're a, you're a great journalist. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, now we're on a little bit boring for the audience, part of the agenda. <laughs> um, I'm approving the agenda. Can I have a motion? Move approval. A second. second. I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Six, zero, one, six, zero. <clears throat> okay, approval of March 27, 2019 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? approval second second all those in favor aye. aye okay now we're gonna close the regular board meeting for a public hearing and the public hearing is a sunshine proposal to PVFT for 2019 2020 2020 2021 2000 221 to 222 school years. And Shona will present, Shona Keeling. <laughs> Thank you, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, excuse my voice, I'm gonna try to get through this. Um, the RADA Act requires that the parties in the collective bargaining process um, to sunshine an initial proposal to provide the public with an opportunity to comment on the proposals prior to the commencement of negotiations. The district, in accordance with the RADA Act, is sunshining their proposal for a multi-year agreement covering uh, 2019 to 20, 2020 to 21, and 21 to 22 school years. Um, PVFT sunshined their proposal on February 13, 2019, and we look forward to receiving their proposals on workload and hours, class size, wages and related matters, evaluation, the mentor program, and early childhood education. In addition to the articles already sunshined by PVFT on February 13th, the district is proposing the following uh, articles for these reasons. Article A, health and welfare to explore cost-saving measures for benefits. Article 12, leaves to make sure that we are in statutory compliance. Article 14, reassignment and transfer to obtain clarification of the language. Article 21, year-round education to discuss the feasibility as we no longer have year-round schools. Article 23, retirement, again, to explore cost-saving measures regarding benefits. Article 24, reopeners, and also we wanna work with uh, PVFT to make sure that 
um, Exhibit A, the unit of exclusive representation, that the list of positions is current. Um, these, this initial proposal does not include additional articles, um, which may be sunshine in the future in, during the course of the negotiation. As a preliminary matter, we appreciate the increasingly collaborative spirit between our district and PDFT leadership as we continue to work together to resolve issues in a positive and productive manner that serves the best interests of the students in our district. Our district looks forward to ongoing collaborative negotiations towards a multi-year agreement that, ben that serves the best interests of our students. Thank you. We have Bill Beecher. Madam President, uh, Superintendent Rodriguez, uh, trustees and staff. Uh, this proposal did not include wage increases. I was very surprised. I would hope that there is positive action in restructuring the health benefits so that teachers have a choice on the trade-off between health coverage and wages. This could allow young teachers a possible in excess of $4,000 increase in wages if they opted for an HSA. This could also allow our older teachers to increase their wages, wages and subsequent retirement amount by choosing higher deductibles and co-pays. This could also allow the district to incentivize our employees to move the health coverage for their working spouses to their spouses' employees or employers. To date, the spouses' employers have been getting a free ride at the expense of our district. It is estimated that 60% of the spouses are employed and could be covered by their employers. This would save a great deal of money for the district and allow us to increase wages. Tell me that we are finally giving our teachers some control over their choices. Thank you. Whoops, discussion from the board. Any questions? No discussion. Okay. <laughs> now we're on visitor non-agenda items, and so I think we've got quite a few of them. First up, we have Lorenzo Hawking. Good afternoon. My name is Lorenzo Hawking. I'm the current teacher at PV High School. I'm a bike tech teacher. I'm here to advocate for the bike tech program at Aptos High and how it impacts people in a very drastic way. I'm also the current operating manager and overseer mechanic of um, the bike shack here in Watsonville for the past nine years. Um, a lot of times we have students, all our students are different styles of educational backgrounds some academic, more hands-on. You know, if you get rid of this program, because we got word that, you know, you guys want to shut it down on the Aptos, and we're here advocating to keep it open. You know, we have a former student here who's going to be speaking. You know, myself, being a bike tech teacher for the past three years, I started at Sequoia High School right across the street. Started with that classroom. Now I'm at PV. When you give a student an opportunity to work with their hands, you know, it makes a big difference. Sometimes, you know, some of the students, they don't like to just sit down in the classroom. So I said, you know what, let's get on the bike, let's go. But also relate it to the bike tech. We're also called bike tech, life tech. Because bicycles are very important. Without the bicycle, 217 year old today, we wouldn't have no cars, no automotives, no airplanes. That's how important the bicycle is. The bicycle is a very intimate, machine that you can use your hands. People think it's very easy, but when they start taking my class, they're like, hey, Mr. Hayes, that's pretty technical. Yes, it is. Our students learn verbiage. 
vocabulary. A lot of them work in the industry. Our, our project Bike Tech is a global nonprofit here, started in Santa Cruz here. Now we're in five states, California, New Mexico, Colorado, Vermont, and Minnesota. We're in five states. We're the only program in the whole country. PV High School, the Grizzlies, we're lucky. We want, we're the only bike tech classroom that has five bike tech classes. Four beginning, one advance. Thank you. Next we have Ton Kennedy. Hope I said that right. Madam President, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Ton Kennedy, and I am the Regional Coordinator for Project Bike Tech, as Lorenzo spoke to. Um, I was out at Aptos High School this past Thursday uh, interviewing students there to find out about their experiences in bike tech. I talked to a number of young women who are taking the class and love that hands-on experience. Uh, there was a range of every one from freshmen to sophomores and juniors and seniors taking the class and they all reported that it made a difference for them. They loved the hands-on component and many of them were interested in careers in engineering or in other technical arenas and they felt that it uh, would apply there. And then later that very day, I was surprised to get a message that uh, PVUSD was thinking about canceling uh, the bike tech CTE class at Aptos High School. Um, last year, there were 46 students enrolled. This year, there are 33, um, sorry, 53 students enrolled. I'm sorry, reverse that. It was the other way around. Um, the, there are a number, as Lorenzo mentioned, there are a number now of classrooms throughout the United States. Um, and we have about 30 schools around the country interested in getting this program in their schools. Um, the classroom itself has about $60,000 worth of equipment in it uh, that we are able to leverage our relationships with the industry. Those relationships with the national bike industry include uh, certifications that our students can receive, which uh, open doors for them for jobs and uh, future career opportunities. And um, just in Santa Cruz County, the bicycle industry employs around 1,000 people and brings in about $800 million a year in revenue. So there's lots of opportunities just right outside our door for young people specifically interested in, uh, in bicycle careers. Though uh, many students choose to go in other directions, we have a number of graduates at UTI and various other places. Thank you for your time. I have some flyers for you as well. Thank you. And uh, next we have Andrew Marquez. Hello everyone. I'm Andrew Marquez. I am uh, I graduated from Atos High. I was in the ROP bike tech class as well as three other ROP classes while at Aptos. And I feel like the bike tech at Aptos prepares you for more than just working on bicycles because you actually build a, a resume, you build a portfolio, you have mock interviews, you actually, you get to see how the industry is. And um, right now I'm currently a career college student that's in the process of transferring. So far, I've heard from a couple of my schools and I really, uh, the bike tech program had a really big impact on why I decided to c pursue mechanical engineering. There was a, a field trip we went to. We went to um, specialize up in Gilroy and we got to see the their design process. We, they actually let us, they gave us a sketch pad and we had to come up with a couple designs for a bicycle. And we all, we all had our designs and it was really interesting to see their process and just how they, it's not just a simple, it's not just a simple bicycle. There's a, a huge process to go through it. And bike tech really, it's not just a bike tech class. It's a process where you get to learn a little bit of everything. You learn technical, you learn um, like skills that you can actually take to the industry. And 
get a job, whether it be in the bicycle field, working as a mechanic, or actually, I dream of actually being designing bicycles. So there's another aspect to where it's not just a simple class. And then you actually, you learn a lot of different aspects. You learn that even the smallest bolt makes the hugest difference. And everything is designed for a certain reason, not just, it's not just there to be there. All right. Thank you. Oh, we're now ha we're now having the unions and management association if they want to come up and speak to us. First, PVFT, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Hi, thank you, Francisco Rodriguez, uh, President. Um, with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. I also wanted to just uh, briefly uh, introduce our president-elect, uh, Nelly Vaquera Bobs. Um, she will be uh, starting uh, July 1st as our new president. Thank you. <laughs> Notice she's wearing a shirt. Yeah, yeah she did. Yeah. Um, so just wanted to uh, make a couple co uh, comments. Uh, number one, uh, last weekend was our uh, annual convention for the California Federation of Teachers, um, and we celebrated our 100 years of existence in California. Uh, so you know, we're affiliated with the AFT, but uh, in California, um, the CFT uh, started 100 years ago, and coincidentally, PVFT was chartered 50 years ago uh, this same year. So. Um, 100 years for CFT, 50 for uh, PVFT. Um, at our convention, we, we passed two uh, very important resolutions. Um, number one, uh, we made a commitment to uh, make sure and let everybody know that it is time to fix California's broken charter school laws. Specifically, um, we as an organization, statewide organization, voted to support the following uh, bills. AB 1505, AB 1506, AB 1507, and AB 1508. What these bills do, it's a package of bills that um, it holds charter schools accountable to our local communities. As you know, when the state, even though the county may disagree, and even though the local boards may disagree, approves a charter, there's an impact upon the students and communities where they locate. AB 15105 by Assembly Member Patrick O'Donnell would give control back to local elected school boards to decide whether a charter school is the right fit for their communities instead of unelected officials who might be several hundred miles away. AB 1506 by Assembly Member Kevin McCarty would establish a cap on the growth, growth of charter schools, ensuring that unchecked charter growth will not destabilize another local school district, as you know is something that may potentially happen here. Mm -hmm. AB 1507 by Assembly Member Smith would close a loophole in the current law that allows a charter school to operate outside of its authorizing district. And 1508, AB 1508 by Assembly Member Bonta would allow local school boards to consider facilities, fiscal, and academic impacts on the district when considering new charter school petitions. So we are uh, hopeful that you will join us 
in supporting these bills uh, by calling your local assembly and Senate representatives, state assembly and Senate representatives, and that um, we control uh, this runaway uh, charter school myth. So the other very important um, resolution that we made was to support what we called the Schools and Communities Act. And that is a, a constitutional change that will, as they say, ensure that grandma stays in her house, but that Disneyland pays their fair share of taxes. So that we no longer have a property thir uh, proposition 13 that gives back money to corporations and allows them to have huge tax breaks that impact us. We're looking at changes that may bring over $11 billion a year in revenue to the state. Um, so we're, we're, we hope that you can join us uh, in those two efforts. We're going to be um, starting our campaign soon and we'll be make sure to um, let you know what you can do to support us. Yeah. And thank you Resolution. for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. CSEA, California School Employees Association. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, I too am sick. <laughs> President Osmerson and Board of Trustees. <laughs> My name is Esther Moreno and I'm Chief Job Steward for Chapter 132. As you know, we're in mourning for one of our very special members and fellow employee, Robert Salazar. We'd like to thank Dr. Rodriguez, HR and payroll for all their kindness and support. It's meant a lot to us, it's meant to the family. <laughs> we will honor Bobby on Friday. by wearing our colors. <laughs> Aunt Tosh is gonna have a beautiful celebration <laughs> from 11 to one. <laughs> and again, I just wanna really thank the district. <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez, Chona Colina, big donations and support. <laughs> the family deeply appreciate it. It's something that I will never forget. <laughs> thank you. Good evening. Um, I, I know it's, the, it's an emotional time for all of us right now. Um, again, just like to reiterate, we have the rosary service tomorrow from 1 to 3 at Mouse. And the um, celebration of life that he so much loved, it's Saturday from 11 to 1. We will be there to support you know the family. But um, again, thank you for your support. And um, unfortunately, cancer doesn't discriminate. And um, I just found out from one of our students at EA Hall who just turned 13 this Monday um, was diagnosed with cancer as well. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's been hard. But, you know, we've moved forward. And um, I know Bobby is there with him and shining some light on this young man who needs it so much. Family, um, the family does... Um, want to, uh, they're okay receiving any, you know, well wishes, prayers. Um, Bobby is, uh, is, I can't say was, it's hard to not know that he's here anymore. Um, he's one of a kind. Uh, he just, he put himself, he put everybody first before himself. His last words were always, are you okay? 
Do you need anything? You know where you can find me. Call me. Keep smiling. Those were always his last words. And uh, we want to thank the district for the support. Thank you. Okay, Pavam, Pottle Valley Association of Managers. Is there anybody here that wants to report for the managers? No? And CWA Communication Workers of America. Nope. Okay, number nine, report and discussion items. And there's going to be one 9.1, which is efficient and effective supports for students. Report by Kristen Schaus. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> You're looking forward to your report. Good evening. Suzanne Smith will also be joining me, uh, the Director of Student Services, as it's been her compilation of work as well that's kind of led us to this point. Uh, a few pieces just as we kind of move through our presentation. There's a, a couple of pieces on here that uh, will be engaged with data and looking at really what those ramifications are and uh, how practices will change as a result. So a few pieces to set context is looking at how we got to a point of looking at the data. So we do know that there's a reason why we're moving to Synergy and that we've had significant issues with eSchools. Part of those issues have included the input of incidences and then how they're coded. So pieces that are going to our system are coded by egg codes. If those egg codes are off or if they're double tagged, then they're generating more information. What CalPADS does is it's our reporting piece that picks up from whatever SIS system we're using. So the student information system we're using, that's what CalPADS draws from. That CalPADS piece then generates what we're doing in terms of the California dashboard. So if one is off, or if we think there may be a discrepancy in data, it's gonna trigger the California dashboard being off as well. So as we kind of came into to the school year, the numbers and the, the resources of really what it looked like in terms of the numbers of incidents definitely was stark. So it looked at what, it, what do we need to look at, what subpopulations are we triggering, and then how effective and how accurate was that data to this point. So a huge push on this is really looking at, as we go through student services, that it requires the same amount of time. And when you think about student services, there's a large number of student needs. So how do we get to a place of defining what those are and actually doing that methodically and strategically the same way that we would use with intent to build curriculum? We spend time looking at resources, we spend time piloting, we spend time making sure that we look at best practices and research-based programs, and then we implement. The same is true even though there's a human factor involved. So when you look at student services, if that data piece is off in the first place, the information that we're analyzing and the decisions that we're making is triggering that piece to be unaligned as well. So a lot of the work that you're gonna see in the next few slides is in relationship to making sure that we get that alignment as well. So over the course of the past three years, you can see some trends with suspension. Uh, so you'll notice we did this by, by level as well, so you can see the number of suspensions. Uh, we did have uh, a drop significantly over the course of the three years. Uh, what we anticipate is that this actually could go up. And the reason why we're anticipating that is because in the next few slides, what you're gonna see decreasing substantially is expulsion. So how do we keep kids on campus, believe in a restorative practice, and actually give re-entry points so that we're not sending our kids to additional programs outside of what we should be able to supply as well. Uh, so we are anticipating potentially a, an upswing that's gonna be a result of the fact that you see a suspension versus us coming to the table with an expulsion instead. So a few pieces. Uh, this was actually one of the first things when I came in in December, I sat down with Suzanne and I said, so explain to me this, this project. You know, what does this look like here? And went out to several different sites and I heard you know, from site administrators, I heard from parents, I heard from uh, several folks in addition, the topic was also brought up. This was kind of already on the radar in terms of what we were looking for to either substantiate uh, or change practice. Uh, so these drug dogs are used in several different districts and it has different outcomes depending on what that use looks like as well. Uh, the, re the original intent of drug dogs was diversion. It was to make sure that you know, students didn't bring uh, substances on campuses that, that folks didn't want, right? 
what we did find, though, is similar to what the entire nation has found. So as we went through, started polling results, uh, we have found it to line up exactly with what uh, the national average would be as well. So in terms of effectiveness, if you were to read this, number of sites uh, that have been used, the number of alerts, and then the accuracy. So this tells the story. If we have 82 rooms searched and 70 alerts, seems like, okay, it might be effective it's, if it's pulling 70 alerts. The problem with that is if you look at the accuracy of those numbers that are actually confirmed, you're talking 29%. So when you really think about the effectiveness of diversion, do we want kids, and if you look at those impacts at the bottom, so on average, and these are run from class sizes of 27 to 34, and that would be generous if it wasn't a PE class or something else, you're impacting, just in the number of reports that we have currently, you're impacting roughly between 2,200 to 2,800 kids to do these pieces. So the impacts for what the accuracy line actually looks like isn't there. There's some other pieces that are out as well that we should be aware of in changing practice. So when you take a, a look at what's currently going on, um, NPR has released additional reports. Those reports came out of UC Davis, so a large study was done in regards to the effectiveness of drug dogs on campuses. Uh, and what they found was that, much as we would expect that there, there are issues and concerns, and I say this with all due respect, I've been in law enforcement before, so I say this with all due respect, but there is bias involved in handlers as well. So the certification piece of that dog is there to protect you as much as it is to make sure that there's an alert. So if a handler has bias in any way, which we have seen kind of rise to the surface in our society as well right now, if a handler has bias in any way, that dog's gonna be triggered, regardless of whether they're actually sniffing or not, because their job is to protect you as well. So those pieces that they're looking at is, what do the certifications of canines actually need to look like, and how deep do they need to go to training to actually increase this accuracy? That work hasn't been done yet. So we're in this place of, of suggesting that that training piece and the authority of, of the accuracy isn't there yet because those canine programs aren't there yet either. Uh, there's a couple of other pieces that are going on in regards to it. So ACLU also published an additional study. What it basically rose to the level of is it took a look at the number of roadside um, pullovers. So the number of roadside pullovers, 73% of the time, it was hitting on Hispanic males. Those pieces were unfounded. So when you talk about that bias piece that's going on, you know, that, that was a very, it was a smaller study in nature, but what they found was that there were law enforcement agencies that were also resistant to want to continue that study because it does generate more conversation around how do dogs portray us as the actual handler as well. So there are some concerns there as well. That piece is still moving forward. And then the last piece that I think probably is uh, the most telling in terms of where the nation is going on this issue as well, you know, as a school district, we, we certainly have different procedures and rights involved, so the Ed Code allows us to do these pieces. But then the next piece of that is, is when you look at uh, the latest publication, so there is a Supreme Court case moving forward currently. It came out of Minnesota, but it actually looks at um, the, the possibility that drug dogs may actually be taken out of serving traditional warrants as well. Because what they're finding is that because they pick up on handlers as well, when a, a dog is sitting on a porch, as soon as that dog triggers, you're allowed to enter the property. So it breaches the actual warrant process. So what they're saying is, let's go back to doing things the correct way, make sure that there is actually uh, a reason and a cause to be doing so. So the piece that, you know, that we're looking at is obviously, we're about restorative pieces, we're about you know, re-entry with our students. So this you know, obviously alerts our cause to change the practices of what's currently being done. Now, where dogs might fit in to our district and where, where we're looking at that as well is those places, for instance, grad night. You're putting a large group of students on a bus where there is more of a prone opportunity for folks to actually be, uh, you know, bringing things that you may not be able to get medical attention for them. So when you're on a bus ride that's four or five hours away and a student has something on the bus, that could be an issue. So those pieces are still being looked at, the number of trips that that would even occur with, what would that look like, because the diversion process isn't to catch kids. Kids would know that that was going to occur automatically. Very similar to if you were to go to the, to the airport, you know what the TSA regulations are because you don't bring those items in. So that's the diversion aspect, is not catching kids. It's letting them know that we want a clean event, this is where we're going with it, so that they don't put themselves or others in medical jeopardy. 
couple of pieces as, as we discussed in terms of that, that suspension piece versus the expulsion line. Um, Suzanne and her team has done a great job too at, at looking at these expulsions and really asking sites and asking administrators of what have we done in supports before we move forward with expulsions. So in 2015-16, you had 48 expulsions. Following year, 40. Uh, you can see this substantially drop. So again, that piece that you're seeing with the suspension line is weighing on the other side of the expulsion. So if you see the 40 to the 12, it means that we're able to keep more kids on campus because of the additional supports. Are we there yet? No, we still have a ways to go, but 12 for a district this size is absolutely phenomenal. So what should student supports look like? So in the past, a lot of systems have been built around compliance. It's about following rules and making sure you follow the rules. But it really is about more than that. It's about the education line that we serve and what we do intentionally to make sure that we cover these areas. So when you look at student services, there's three other buckets that fit. So you're looking for connection. If we can make solid connections with students, they're less likely to get involved in things that we don't want them involved in. You also have the curriculum side. So what pieces are we using to intentionally teach practices that are healthy for our students? And you're gonna see that in a couple of slides ahead. And then the last piece, which is that there are compliance pieces that we have to follow. So there are five mandates by ed code, similar pieces like that that we have to follow. So these are a few pieces that are, are currently going on on our, our sites. Are you comfortable with talking about a few of these pieces? Sure, you can. Okay. So a few pieces with Five Star. So Five Star actually looks at the data collection of what we use to reward students. Uh, we also have bullying education pieces, PBIS, which is lifting off uh, quite heavily in this coming year as well, how we use office discipline for referrals. So it's not necessarily about the consequence, you're gonna see that in a, a few minutes here, but it's also about the support line that comes with that because that's where you get the restorative and the reentry piece with students. So one of the most important pieces um, for me as far as expulsion is our, my Valor team. And this is a team that I've spoken to you many times, um, for, but for those of you that are new, um, it's my team that every time a student is expelled, they're assigned a case manager. So that case manager follows that student um, helps them get through with their community service hours, goes to the school site, checks on their grades, works with the family. They make sure they get the counseling that they need. And they, a lot of times, if it's a, a suspension, suspended expulsion over the summer, they'll work with them also with summer programs and get them really involved. And again, that goes back to the connected piece. They have someone so that when they get expelled, even if they're going over out of the, you know, COE to the, out, out of our district over to COE, I still have my Valor team that meets with them on a regular basis and that I meet with them once a month. And we go over line by line, every student, how they're doing and where they're going. And it's really proven to be very successful um, because we can really keep track of those kids and help them when it's time for them to re-enter. So that's my Valor team. Check in, check out. Um, is a simple process. Many schools do it differently, but the standard way, especially at the high school, because we have social emotional counselors at all the high schools five days a week, is a student, depending on what their issues are, they'll go check in with the teacher or check in with the counselor right before school. Then they will check in with all their teachers, get little marks. Again, every, every system's different. And at the end of the day, they check in again with the counselor. One of the biggest pieces um, that we've had over the last five years now are social emotional counselors. They've done a great job. Um, they've provided a lot of support to our academic counselors as well, because our academic counselors also have a small part of the social emotional. It's, they all have the same credential and are able to do that piece, but when it comes to a crisis or something, um, self-harm, something that's much more uh, needed for assistance, the social emotional counselors are there, and they are at every single school in the district. So we've been busy kind of setting the stage of those pieces that we're already involved in and you'll be able to see kind of the manpower that's going on behind the scenes with student services. Uh, again, it's a very intentional push and drive to align services. But if you take a look at the equity piece, so in 2009, 48,900 Ks, which was disruption in a classroom, was you essentially could not suspend for that anymore, which definitely changed how we were handling practices with students across the board. Uh, but, but what currently happened was what the state said was that you cannot have a metrics, which means if a student throws a trash can across ca a, a classroom, it's not an automatic suspension. What you had to do was look through progressive discipline. So as these pieces ran through, it was about not just the consequence, but it was about the support. What ended up happening in a lot of districts was that we just tossed the metrics all together and we didn't use anything. Uh, so one of the conversations that we've had is how do we onboard and how do we guide folks to make those decisions? So that when you're sitting at Watsonville High versus when you're sitting at PV High and you have a student that came in and it's their first use of marijuana, what is the response that we have as a district? 
Is it an immediate expulsion? Obviously not. Is it suspension plus referral to outside sources? Is it drug and alcohol counseling on site? So those are the pieces that we're working through with our APs as well as our site leaders right now. But it's to get a guide and parameters as to making sure that we get rid of that disparity and really focus on not being subjective about who's sitting in front of us and whether that person may have gotten in trouble you know, the day before or you know, all of those bias pieces that enter the picture as well. A few other pieces, uh, PBIS, uh, traditionally the state has run a conference in October, it's very difficult to get into, and a lot of the sessions are usually filled. Um, being back in the area, we were able to make some additional connections with Santa Clara County as well. Uh, we actually increased that 35 spots to 50 spots. Uh, we have three folks going from each one of our middle schools in addition to our elementaries and high teams. Uh, so we have a substantial body and we'll be bringing that group back together as a district PBIS team as well to really get that lift that we need in changing practice. Uh, in addition, the multi-tiered systems of support, it's bringing in kind of that conceptual map of what does it look like for baseline service for all of our students from the social emotional side as well as the academic side and then moving supports forward with tier two. So as those that comes forward, you're gonna see more information in regards to what that looks like and what that means. We've also been working on counseling. So taking a look at the assessment of contacts and the types of counseling. So as, as you start to look at systems pieces, you wanna have the correct data. So it kinda goes back to that first slide that we were talking about. If we don't have the data that we need to make the decision, then we're making a decision in really isolation of putting band-aids on fixes, really looking at how the system as a whole is working and how are we generating those contacts and what are those contacts. Uh, you know, this evening, it's very touching to hear how much Bobby had an impact with students. That is a classified member of our group. So there are entry points and there are areas within this work that are not exclusive to certificated counselors, that are not exclusive one of the major needs that we have is mentors. We have a major need for mentors. We have a major need for mentors with Hispanic males. You know, these are not new or different. These are looking at our systems and saying, what is really the need? And do we need to realign some pieces in order to make sure that we're meeting what our students' needs are? In addition, uh, digital citizenship, we actually have had that piece on board, but we are doing a scope and sequence that rather than, um, you know, a sixth grader, Again, the alignment issue, sixth grader, seventh grader, eighth grader, what should be the expectation as our kids go through that digital ci citizenship piece to make sure that they've actually hit all of those modules, that they're not repeating modules depending on which site they may be at uh, or which person picked that module for the following year. So making sure that those boundary lines are drawn. From the health side, you know, you're looking at signs of suicide. So how do we get in classrooms and have the conversations that we sometimes don't wanna have in regards to this? We know that it's a huge impact but this is also building out, just one of these pieces is building out the, the nature of what happens when you have that conversation. Because when you have that conversation and you, you bring in something like signs of suicide or any of these pieces, you also have the triage the next three days because that's when kids are coming to us for their peers. And it usually is peer report, not themselves. Uh, so definitely something uh, to look at. Uh, these are those compliance pieces. So human trafficking, the AB uh, 1227, uh, trauma-informed training, a reestablishment really in, in bolstering that LGBTQ plus task force. So all of these pieces are moving forward. Um, a highlight too is the de-escalation. So how do we de-escalate students using verbal commands and actually using that process first uh, before we get into a place where, you know, restraint or other, other pieces come forward and how do we do that well so that no one gets hurt and that we give people more tools to be able to de-escalate students. Attendance campaigns. Uh, so this is something that we are working with outside vendors, but it needs to be tied closer to our PBIS. So how do we get the message to our kids that they want to be on campus, that we have connected tools, and how do we really support that through our PBIS line as well? SB 1626, that has been around for quite some time, but we are moving to alignment of making sure that actually is in effect. So safety and security staff, uh, which would include anybody that's doing that work. So if you have assistant principals, if you have uh, principals that are out doing this work as well in supervision, it's important that they are trained in this as well. So these are modules based. They are based out of the post board certification. So they are actual hours that come out of that training. Uh, it's 24 hour requirement of those service hours if you're working more than 20 hours in that capacity. Covers laws, regulations, de-escalation, emergency response, et cetera. 
progress monitoring. So I spoke to you uh, in regards to synergy and the capacity that we believe that that is going to have in setting those pieces up. But it's gonna really look at those early warning indicators and how do we get kids supports earlier. Um, and that last piece, which is really the publishing of a team drive, that is that additional alignment of saying here are the tools that when you onboard and you're at a site, you clearly know how to do a proper investigation, what questions do we ask, what are subjective questions versus bias questions, all of those pieces, uh, including that discipline guide, attendance school kits, et cetera, so that we have some streamlined processes in place as well. The major piece of this is that this, the work is not easy. We understand that there's a need, we understand that there's humans involved in this and our, and our kids can be in crisis, but we have to do this right. And in order to do this right, there, there tends to be this, this place of going, we have to dig and get more data sometimes. So while the process may look like we're moving in several directions, we still don't have as much information and as much data as we need, but we are working on that. Um, it, we're still providing reports in regards to that, but without that low level alignment, without having some of those guides, what we've ended up creating is, you know, I've, I've said multiple times, if, if you're in a situation where you haven't given guidance, people are gonna make their guidance on their own. And that's when we get into trouble because we start kind of patching holes with things versus really looking at it from a systems perspective and understanding what those needs are and asking students. That's close. <laughs> Thank you very much. We got some public speakers. First off, we have Ramiro Medrano. Medrano Ramiro. Good evening. My name is Ramiro Medrano. I am a longtime resident of Watsonville, born and raised. I'm also a counselor and alum, uh, alumni. I don't know. I don't know how you say it. alum, alumni, um, and a parent in the district. I have two daughters that attend this district. Today, I come to speak on this issue um, of drug dogs on campus from a counselor perspective. I am a counselor in the district. Uh, going on to three years. And I've been a counselor in five different schools, from middle schools to alternative high school at Renaissance, and now I'm at PV. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I actually enjoyed your presentation, uh, and um, I agree with a lot of the things that um, Ms. Schultz uh, said. Um, I think that uh, it is unfortunate that we are using this program in our district. Um, I, as uh, From a counselor perspective, I have seen it um, where students are pulled out of class and been searched because a, dro a, a dog alerts on them only to find nothing. Most of the times actually that I witnessed students being pulled out and being searched, they didn't find anything on the student. Um, and yes, you know, it was said, we have to remember that we're talking about kids. We have to remember we're talking about people. And this means that, you know, when the, the, when the dog alerts on the student, you know, there's the embarrassment of being alerted on. There is sort of like this violation of privacy because then they are taken to a room and, being, and, and are searched. There's a breach of confidentiality because as I stated last time I was here, who knows if perhaps in the home someone smokes. And regardless how we feel about that, it is perfectly legal in California now for adults to smoke. So if a student's backpack smells, you know, and a dog alerts on them, and then they have to go back and answer questions to their peers of, hey, why did the dog alert on you? Like, like you got some, or you know, have you smoked? Or, and then for some students, they have to endure that embarrassment and they have to explain themselves. For some students, perhaps, that's a badge of honor for them. And then there's an image that they have to uphold. And they feel that moving forward, like that's part of the, you know, their image. So um, I also wanted to point out you know, uh, some of the data because uh, I know for a fact that at Rolling Hills, there the dogs have gone in, and 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 uh, this school year, I know for a fact that at New School they have. I know for a fact that at Lakeview they ha they have. So the data is not complete. 
And so that, I suspect that if we had a full picture, that the success rate would even be lower. Um, 20 out of the 70, 20 students out of 70 that the dogs alerted to had drugs. But if we really add it up, it's actually about 3,000 students that are in those rooms. And so I did the math. 0.007% of our students are found with drugs based on that, da on that data. Seven out of 1,000 students that have been in the rooms when the dogs go in and the dogs are searching have been found with drugs. I think that's a testament to our students. I think we have to believe in our students a little bit more. And, and I'm here to say that we should adopt uh, preventative programs that are going to work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we have Jaime Sanchez. Good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is Jaime Sanchez, and um, <coughs> I, I think that that uh, we all have uh, sworn to defend and support the Constitution of the United States and the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants <coughs> and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized so So, so by embracing this this blanket search over all these hundreds of students, you, you're violating the constitution. <laughs> you're you're it's it's a uh, it's unconstitutional. You're uh, submitting them to mm -hmm. to their uh, privacy being violated. So that, that's my comment for this evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Next, we have Elias Gonzalez. Uh, President Osmondson, uh, board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, as stated, my name is Elias Gonzalez. I am a parent of two, pro, you know, two PVUSD students. Uh, I'm also a graduate of Watsonville High School, a lifelong resident, uh, and I worked in the community uh, for a long time, um, with you know, along with the probation department and county mental health. Um, so the reason I'm here today is because honestly, I'm I'm really highly concerned. I'm highly concerned that we are even thinking about putting police dogs in our campus. I believe this practice has been happening for years already. Um, and the reality that we don't have the data to actually prove this work already, to me, I'm wondering why we don't have this data. Why, well, I mean, it's been a long time and we should have this data. We're in a time of data. You know, data is about evidence-based. So I'm wondering where is this data and why hasn't it been brought up? Um, I also was brought up at this meeting this meeting came up sometime about around in April, I think it was supposed to happen. And I looked on the agenda last night, I didn't see this PowerPoint or anything there on it. So I'm wondering why <coughs> this process went this way. As a community member, I'm just wondering that. Um, as stated earlier, um, I'm, I am confused by this lack of creativity. Uh, resorting to police talks is our last option. <coughs> you know what I mean? The reality is that we do need a lot of work. There's a lot of systems. I'm a graduate myself. I went through a lot of these systems, and I was not on the good side of the spectrum. I was on the other side. Being on that other side put me through all these systems. I'm for education and not prisons. The last, pl the places we see police dogs are in these institutions. Mm -hmm. We don't see them in schools, okay? Let's start thinking about this. This is children we're talking about. We're not talking about criminals, and when we start putting children, when we start putting police dogs, in these systems, what message are we sending to our kids? I have a young daughter that went through the system. 
And she went through a lot. And the system didn't support her. And that's why I'm here to ask for more counselors, more support, more mentors. I agree with the presentation. There was a lot of good stuff there that we should be doing. But I'm confused because I stood up here and I'm hearing that presentation and it sounds very good. But no one's saying that we are going to go back to these practices that were started during the slave days to control populations, to control people. So there's a lot of data that I want to go over, but the lack of time always happens. Um, but with that said, um, I think the trustee de Serpa said one thing earlier. The face-to-face -face relationships matter. And if you put a dog sniffing dog in front of me, that tells me where you stand with my relationship. Mm -hmm. Put a teacher in front of me. Put a human being in front of me. Put a person in front of me. Don't put a dog sniffing dog in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I think with that said, I'll close it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next we have Eliana Gonzalez. Okay, good evening. My name is Eliana Gonzalez. I'm a student of the Pajaro Valley School District and I'm here against the use of police dogs in, on campuses. Okay. So, I had the privilege of growing up with both of my parents that were very loving, very supportive, and very involved. They're at every soccer game, every play that I could even remember. Um, once I hit middle school, it was a lot different for me, okay? It, I was exposed to a lot of new things and I didn't have the support on campus that I had at home from my parents. Um, I understand that there are a lot of students at schools, but I think maybe if I had a little bit more help, I would have been a lot more successful. Once I hit high school, I was, exposed, I was exposed to even more, more than I was exposed to in middle school. That led me to have a lot, a, a very rough couple of years for me, okay? Um, as Kristen Schaus mentioned, her pro the programs that they actually mentioned, I'm sorry. Um, I tried PVPSA, and for the most part, they were unavailable every time I tried them. They're only there for about two or three times a week. Um, I tried the social emotional counselors, and they're always busy, okay? Because what's the likelihood of two teens in their most intense emotional years to have a bad day on the same day? It's pretty high if we think about it. Um, because of the lack of sources that I had, this led me to ditching, okay? I never wanted to go to class. Um, my grades dropped really bad and I was always an honor roll student. And I eventually got kicked out of the school because my social emotional counselor thought that my best option was to go to another school. Um, once I found my new school, which is actually uh, upstairs, <laughs> I, I did a lot better, a lot better. I had one, on help, one help with my teachers and they were a lot more concerned about everybody's mental health. Um, because of the sport that I had, I was able to strive. I'm now actually at Cabrillo. I still attend Pacific Coast Charter, but I'm taking 11 units at Cabrillo, three classes on top of that at my own school. I'm very ahead on credits. I worked at Starbucks for the last year, and I know what I wanna go to college for. Um, I'm sharing this story just to show you all that we don't need any more equipment to discipline our students. Um, what happens now is gonna happen regardless of if we put a cop or a dog on campus. Um, as a student of the district, I think instead of trying to discipline us, I think we should get more res resources on campus to help us before we get to that point. Um, because I went through the system and I failed there completely. Um, but once I got the resources I need, I was able to do a lot better than I thought I could at 17. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Emily Halbig. Hi, good evening. Board members, Dr. Rodriguez, <coughs> Ms. Schaus, I'm looking forward to actually meeting you tomorrow at New School. Um, today, I wanted to, so I'm a teacher at New School. I've been in the district for 14 years. Um, taught elementary, I was a technology coach at a few of our middle schools, and I'm at uh, high school, alternative high school now. So I've kind of seen the progression of what happens, especially with kids that, you know, 
have trauma come to school as a young child and then that trauma might not be addressed, those relationships don't get formed and they end up, you know, not succeeding in the traditional comprehensive school and then they come to new school if we're lucky. So, you know, the ones that are there, we're actually really lucky to have them there because a lot of them have kind of given up at that point. So um, what I wanted to talk about today, which Ms. Schaus um, referenced a little bit in her presentation, is the need for restorative justice in our schools. And um, I recently, I did my master's thesis on restorative practices in schools and, you know, we're doing PBIS, which is great. Um, we're doing these trainings on trauma-informed learning, and that's great. But, you know, what I really feel is kind of missing is that piece of um, building the relationships in the community inside the classroom. And our, our students, I feel a lot of them feel really disconnected from school. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, the use of drug sniffing dogs, as was mentioned, is one of those reasons that leaves students feeling humiliated, anxious, angry, not wanting to come to school, right? Um, I know the intention is to deter them, um, but really the data shows I think the only thing that it successfully does is accomplish, is creating like an unfriendly, unhealthy school environment for the kids. Um, so to me it's not just about deterring them from bringing marijuana to school or coming to school high, but it's really about you know, addressing the reasons why they're turning to drug use in the first place and then providing them with support in order to make better choices both at school and away from school. And so I'm gonna come back to the idea of connectedness. And, you know, with young people, it's important that they feel a sense of inclusion, belonging, um, you know, having a healthy relationship with their, uh, with their classmates and with their teachers is essential for them to become you know, successful academically and socio-emotionally, and that's what restorative practices do. In, in particular, um, incorporating restorative circles, training our teachers on how to do that um, from the early ages all the way up as, you know, Oakland Unified has done it, Salinas Union Elementary is doing restorative justice, and I think PBIS is a good step in the right direction, but I think that those two things can really work hand in hand. And, you know, I just want to close by saying that I think that the district is really lucky because you guys have educators like myself, counselors that are informed about restorative practices um, that have started to employ them in our schools and that could be an asset you know, to work with you guys as a team to bring that uh, on a larger scale to our district. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And finally we have Edgar Abara. Good evening, buenas tardes. My name is Edgar Ibarra. I'm, uh, I'm part of a community organization called Milpa. It's based out of Salinas, but I'm a longtime resident of Watsonville. You know, it's pretty alarming that we stand here you know, on, the, on the verge of Cesar Chavez Day and talking about dr drug sniffing dogs. You know, my understanding of what I've read throughout, throughout my years is that drug sniffing dogs or just canine dogs were used to break picket lines at one point or another and then create harm during the civil rights movement boycotts, et cetera, et cetera. So when we really look at what we're bringing to our schools and why we're bringing them, they're just Band-Aids. These are just Band-Aid recipes, you know? You know, we got to think big. If we want to really kind of put a dent and start changing culture, culture doesn't just start in high school. It's done right there. Elementary, building relationships, first and foremost, is the most important thing, building relationships. And what does that really mean? You know, talking about values. We're so focused and caught up about English, math, science, all that. What about respect? What about integrity? What about unity? What about those type of values and morals that sometimes, you know, because our parents are at work all day, go by and we don't get to, we don't, we don't learn them. Sometimes we find those in the streets. You know, and uh, unfortunately for myself, you know, uh, I navigated the whole system in and out. I know what it is to have a, a dog come by you either in the cell or outside on the yard and sniff you and put you down. I know what it see, looks like when your parents come and visit you in a, an institution and have your parents get sniffed as well. I know what it is to get pulled over and have the dog sniff you. I know what it is and how it feels like to have your house raided and have a dog while your parents and nephews and nieces and everybody's right there. 
you know, so the trauma that is being impacted and being perpetuated by this is not, just not necessarily at school, it's all around our community. So as a community, we need to work together and come up with better solutions. Our creativity is boundless. I don't think this is a solution. I believe that all of us together here as a community, everybody, we can do a better job together. Also, but re recognizing that this, this presentation was well put. There's a few things missing, but also the, the talk about mentors, that's really important. You know, culturally relevant programming, not just trauma informed, healing informed. We're too much focus and giving too much time to the negative. Healing informed, I mean, what does that really mean? You know, to each and every one of you and us as a community, we need to focus on that. You know, because for too long, and we gotta just keep it real, there's institutionalized racism that has happened and that continues to happen. There are biases that are implanted and happen subconsciously that we don't even know is happening. You know, and that reality, that is a reality you know, that in our communities. So I do strongly urge you to really reconsider this dog, drug sniffing dog and start looking at different programs. Different programs that are gonna help and uplift and build communities, not just the child itself, but the families in our community and our totality to make our whole community better in all aspects. That's just in Buenas Noches. Thank you. And Okay, is there any questions from the board? Yeah. So where are we at with the dog sniffing program? I know, Kristen, you looked into some information. I wanna know where we're at as far as what um, contracts we're under, mm -hmm. what the cost is to the distri sure. district. So staff is actually seeking direction from the board in regards to drug sniffing dogs as well. Uh, tonight, you've heard, you know, what the stats currently are. You've also heard me address what the issues and the concerns are from handling bias, ACLU violations, et cetera. Uh, you've also heard some, some very passionate folks. I will tell you, we do have community on both sides with this, so I think that's important to understand as well. But, um, you know, again, uh, we are looking for staff direction in regards to the practices and the intentions of it. Um, just to say a few additional words. Um, so staff recommendation is that we restrict the use of the, within the schools. I do want to note that we were requested um, several months ago to place this, um, place the dogs at Renaissance um, High School and we refused to put the drug dogs at Renaissance High School because we felt it was contradictive of the restorative practices that we're trying to do at Renaissance. Um, and so our, our recommendation is that we use the dogs only um, after we've looked at the data and for very specific and targeted um, events so that we no longer take them um, within the classrooms um, the way in which they're currently used. As with all contracts, um, we are not required to go past we aren't required to continue to use them. What board authority provides us is it provides us the ability to use a certain service up to a certain time and up to a certain amount. It doesn't mean that you have to use it up to the time and up to the amount. That's why it's not a required vote, but it's rather direction. Any other comments? I have a couple questions sure. for you. Um, so out of the current supports, student supports that we have in place, do we have uh, at least some data on which of those that you, you covered in your presentation have been the most effective in addressing uh, the needs of our students? I would say at this point, because of the tracking and the monitoring, this is very similar to the conversation we're having. Um, it's a variety of factors. I would not feel confident telling the board that there is one piece that works or not. The other thing that I think that we should be aware of is that um, not all students respond to the same level of support. So I think we're still in a place of, we have looked at contact minutes, we have looked at the types of contacts that our counselors are having, uh, but in large format in terms of whether it's a small group drug intervention or whether it's outside referrals, um, the, the answer would be no in terms of looking at that. I think a major issue that we do have is early identification. 
So I think as we get that, it will be a little bit better in, in front of, you know, as, as folks have been speaking, it's about catching it before it gets to the place of crisis. So I think we still are in the, the work of really making sure that we have those pieces in place to catch kids. So when this item was initially introduced, the, mm -hmm. the drug sniffing dogs years back, I was completely against it, and I still am. Sure. Um, so I, I do want to move in that direction. I think we can do better as a district. I think, as one of the speakers said, this only serves as a band-aid to a problem. Um, it's, it's not addressing the root of the problem, and I think that's the direction that I want to move forward. I want to move forward in a direction where we have early warning indicators in place to prevent instead of constantly being intervening. At this point, I feel like we've always, to a certain extent, not all students, but I feel like when we review the expulsions, there's always recurrent behaviors, and I always feel like we are failing our students because of this lack of data, because of, of uh, the lack of data that really should be informing the type of preventative measures that should be um, held in place. So I think that as a district, we should definitely consider uh, getting the dogs out of our schools. And, and even, I know, uh, I know Dr. Michelle mentioned using the, utilizing the dogs for certain events only. I don't even like the idea of that. I think there could be other ways uh, for us to be able to handle that. So I'm in full support of removing this program from our schools. I'll see how well I can speak, but basically um, I teach ethics to nurses and one of the ethical principles that you know we teach nurses is one, to do no harm and I think we're seeing you know, from our community members that this is, this is harming. And another ethical principle is you know, beneficence, to do good. And what I, am I remembering correctly that I saw 29% accuracy rate? That is correct. That doesn't speak to doing good to me. Um, what, I, what I would like maybe to have a further conversation mm -hmm. if we're gonna talk about limited use, I, I would like to have further conversations you know, about what that actually looks like. Um, but definitely stepping back from just this current program mm -hmm. is absolutely important. Good. Of the, I know maybe you don't have the total data, but of the <laughs> time, you know, the very small amount of kids that were found with some type of contraband, um, do we know what happened to those kids? So part of that is the alignment of service level too. So it, depending on the site that they're at, that goes back to that discipline and supports guide piece of what then becomes the next place. Uh, so in large part, those students are suspended on our campuses. And then ideally, and these are the pieces that we're still looking into kind of pulling, which is which were the ones for ones, because we don't actually get the roster on this site as to, they give us an overall hit, they don't necessarily give us the students. So as we're working with the sites, what was the support line that we put in place when the student came back? So did we put in an additional measure to make sure that that restorative piece actually is coming back on reentry? So we don't have an overall number of that. So Suzanne will remember this. She was um, here in the district, but when I um, first took my seat the first couple of years because I am a mental health professional, um, you know, we used to get a stack like this high of, of expulsions and um, I started voting no on the expulsions because there was always lots and lots of evidence about why this kid needed to be expelled, but not a shred of what we did to prevent that expulsion. And what we found also around that time was that there was no standard way of dealing with kids who were getting in trouble at school. It was just every campus doing it totally differently. So we, we embarked on trying to improve that, and, that, and what I'm hearing you say is that um, we're gonna do more so that it's an equitable, si more equitable situation, but we've come a long way from the early years, eight years ago. Yeah, um, I also, like Maria, had problems with the dogs, and they're not scary police dogs, they're golden retrievers and Labradors. We, ha we did have a very big contingent of parents who liked the idea because they don't want their kids being 
exposed to drug selling, that kind of thing on campuses. And I think it, in that way, it probably was a deterrent. However, so many of our families um, have been affected by injury and have to take prescribed narcotics or um, they smoke now, you know, marijuana or they had been smoking all along and that those things get on kids clothing and backpacks and maybe it's not the kid and I was always um, very concerned about the humiliation, the embarrassment for the kids. So I would support um, pulling the dogs out of um, our campuses. I think that's a good idea. I'd like to see it replaced with something else. Now, um, that leads me to another issue where we had put in a sort of a restorative program at Aptos High that then this board voted to expand at the other campuses and that was an in-house suspension program with a full curriculum and mentors on campus so that kids weren't humiliated um, by you know, being, being labeled bad kids and being thrown out of school. They were actually suspended on campus with a full curriculum and um, sort of a treatment model program and then there were other um, assigned, I think, teachers and counselors on campus who would check in with those kids regularly. Can somebody tell me what's going on? Because what I have heard is that we are no longer operating those programs. Go ahead. And, and that was no, never disclosed to us. We are still us. operating. We yes. are. Yes. On all campuses? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, secondary, the traditional high schools. And I think a lot of it is students have to be willing to do the diversion program. And the parents. Yeah, they yeah. both have to be. So yeah. it is still available. Oh, good. Okay. A, a couple of, of, so we talk data a lot. So just a couple of, of misnomers, too, is that if you suspend a student, though we keep them on campus, that still counts as a suspension because what you're doing is keeping them out of normal access and universal access of their curriculum. So that, again, when we talk about the coding and making sure the data is correct, it's making sure that our sites understand that when you take a student out of their instructional level, and even though it's a diversion level, it still is going to count as a suspension in your numbers. So we don't get an ADA for that kid that day? or You'll get ADA on them, but it's okay. still going to count as a suspension. So they're kind of reading that's into okay. two different lines. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, so that makes me very pleased to hear that that's still going on. And I don't know if that program can be even improved because it does kids no good to have to be suspended off of campus where nobody can really keep their eyes on them because the parents are working. So, um, so I like the idea of them staying on campus. It's a great presentation, and I'm glad we're really trying to, um, you know, improve the way that we think about young people. Thank you. <laughs> so I always voted against the dogs. I never was into the dogs. I was totally opposed to the dogs too. But um, and I don't. I think I don't want them used for any in any circumstances at all. I, I would like to see that there, we don't use them at all, because um, we could, you know kids are going on a bus or whatever we can just ch check make sure students are everything's cool um, <coughs> and your presentation was really good and I'm and I'm optimistic about where we're going and um, you know and, and if we can do like she said more restorative practices too with the PBIS is important that we're doing I think that's really good but if we can figure out more restorative practices to do in our district that would be very good because the school districts that are using restorative justice in their schools are doing really well. I think they're doing them. I think they're doing it in Oakland. I'm not sure where they're doing them, you know. But they're doing really. It's it's really incredibly good, good program that they're doing. And I mean, I just want to say, I think the dogs, like the ACLU has said, have ended up doing things that have ended up being racially biased against students um, um, in places not just here perhaps but all over the all over the country where they have been used and so I am 100 percent opposed to that kind of thing ever happening in our schools that's bad news um, so yeah so my direction would be the sooner we can get rid of the dogs <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. I'm relatively new to all this, but I represent Ye Hall. Um, the, it's one of the schools in my district, and I've seen bes besides one month, there was no instances of any of alerts, alerts confirmed, or any residual odors. So if we can, I know this is just a discussion, but at least for sure, if we could take them out of Ye Hall, um, the numbers are. <laughs> They're, they're, you know, there's all zeros in this report. It's a great report. You've, you've done a lot of great reports. 
And I believe when you get suspended, when I got suspended, um, it was called OCSE, On Campus Suspension Center. And so um, that's where we stayed on campus. Thank you. <laughs> All I right. make a um, motion and ask that this be put on a future agenda item to be voted on. Do I need a motion? Um, <laughs> so there wouldn't be a need for a vote. Okay. So we, we, I think we heard clearly that um, the desire of the board is to remove the dog, yes. so we'll do that immediately. Great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to move along. It's getting late. Um, 9.2, update English learner reclassification criteria, Michael Berman. Good evening, President Osmondson, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. Just to clarify, I do not have any new policies for you. I, I know that you're disappointed in that. On um, the second meeting, <laughs> we're going to move on those. <laughs> um, to set the context of what we do have tonight, um, many members of the board and um, the audience were present in early January when we went to Sacramento um, to the, the State Board of Education, and the item before that which brought us there um, was about reclassification criteria for um, LPAC. And there was a recommendation. And, oh, now I went past. The person who presented was that gentleman. Um, that is Robert Lin Quanti. He is, he's been the state data guru um, for ELs for many, many years. And um, I'm, I'm throwing him in there because he's kind of my bona fides because one of the last things that he said, he retired on the 1st of March. And on the 28th of February, I was at the um, Bilingual Coordinators Network meeting, and he did a presentation. It was also his birthday, so he ran late because everybody was make, giving him a big hubbub about his retirement and birthday. And his, the last thing he said in front of everybody was, and I was gonna show you the, the reclassification proposal that, PV, that Pajaro Valley has, so if you have any questions, talk to Mike. So. <laughs> That, that's yeah. just more to like, you know, set the stage for where we're going here. <laughs> um, and just, just again for context, there are four criterion for, um, for reclassification. The first one being LPAC, um, the, the, the proficiency assessment. And then, the, and then there's teacher evaluation, parent opinion, and then a comparison of student performance and basic skills, um, which is usually the state assessment. And we, we can also do local measures like MAP. Um, and one thing that's important about number four is that it's got to be based on performance of English proficient students in the same age group. So y there has to be some, some metrics that show a comparison between those two. And this is just to kind of say why. If you look at the RFEPs, who are the, the middle teal group and the English only, there's a, there's a good comparison between their academic performance and what we're our goal is to, to move all of our ELs into that group of students or higher. Um, the, the, the guidance that Robert Linquanti gave us that day was that, um, first of all, go back a couple months, what, the, what they found was that the, the LPAC data was inconsistent. There were a lot of students who scored into f in four in first and second um, grade up to, up to 42%, but then they got to third grade and only 12% we're getting to the four. And there was a large discrepancy between as you went up and down the grade levels. So what they wanted to do was find scaled scores at every grade level that represented a similar amount of proficiency, i.e. somewhere between 14 and 15%. Um, so they decided to change the scale scores. And then once they did that, they went back and, and re um, wanted to clarify their guidance to all of us. So with their guidance is now a four. So you have to be a four on LPAC in order to um, qualify for the first criteria for reclassification. What that will do, it will lower the numbers of students who qualify because they, uh, they, they raise the bar for a four in most grade levels. And so that, that will potentially um, result in fewer students meeting the criteria. This is our current um, board approved form. It's the interim reclassification criteria that we're using this year. Interim because we were waiting for guidance from the state. As you'll see, there are many columns and many rows. 
one thing that happened, you'll see later, is that the recommendation from the state and then further conversations with, with Robert um, helped us make it a, a lot simpler. I'm gonna um, talk about the data very briefly. If you see the middle um, column in both where there's a four on the bottom, those are the students who scored a four on LPAC. Right next to them are the EOs. And the whole point of what we're trying to show here is that the diamond in the middle of the four is supposed to be as close as possible to the diamond in the middle of the EO. That represents that criteria four where there's, there's data that shows comparability between our fours that we're trying to reclass with English proficient students. What they found was that the, with the current um, criterion, there wasn't, there wasn't congruence. But then what Robert and his team did is they looked at um, similarly situated EOs and recent RFEPs. And what they found there was that there is congruence between the fours, the, the, the fours that took the, e the LPAC on the new cut score and similarly, similarly situated EOs and new RFEPs. And if you can see the far right box in both for both seventh grade and 11th grade, the, the, the dotted red line hits both, the, both diamonds for the four and for the similar, similarly situated and new RFEPs. Does anybody want me to go over there and point to what I'm talking about? Are we good? We're good. So ultimately, we have a cleaner reclassification criteria form. It, the only, um, the changes are that it's just a four for the top row, which is LPAC proficiency overall. And then for the academic achievement, third through 12th grade is the cut score of the midpoint. I, I guess I didn't, I didn't mention that, by the way. The dotted red line represents the midpoint of approaching standards met. It's, not, it's no longer standards met because what they found is students who are approaching, who are at the midpoint or above on the SBAC, the state test uh, in reading, and, um, are, are equivalent to the students um, with their score who are fours. We're good there, right? So therefore, we go over here, and then through third, thr third through 12th grade, the main criteria for is the SBAC English Language Arts, uh, midpoint of nearly met. We still have the NWA MAP um, re reading score as an alternative. It's an OR. So if they meet either of those with a, with a threshold at 10th grade. So if, if you're in 11th grade and you meet the mean for 10th grade, you also, um, you also meet that criteria. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you. If, if we have um, fewer students qualifying, what effect might this have on Title I funding? Um, for Title I funding, uh, title, we get our funding for Title III funding is our EL funds. And our students who reclassify stay, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's for four years that they stay within um, our criteria for, for still collecting Title III, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm new to the job, and that's something that I just learned. FPM helped me. Yeah. So I, di I did want to note that the percentages that you did see up there were um, statewide. Yeah. So just so that you're aware, those are not necessarily PVUSD numbers, but those are statewide numbers. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Our numbers will proportionally go down probably, similar to that. It's very similar to what happened with when we had CST and we went to SBAC, right? So CST's assessment was much easier comparison to SBAC. So that's the exact same thing that's happening here is the CELT was significantly easier than LPAC. And so we're just going to see um, equal measures. Um, but I will say that having MAP does allow us to have an additional layer that will allow for reclassification that if we didn't have, um, we would reclass even fewer students. So because um, so we do have two assessments. And one of our current um, structure, we, we purposely kept it high so right now, the criteria, we have, t we have multiple criteria for criteria one, right? There's tier one and tier two. It could be overall three with certain categories being in four. However, 
we do have for our criteria four for the SBAC at standards met. So by raising the bar to four overall on LPAC, we are, we're, we're gonna lose some students that would, would otherwise um, reclassify. However, be based on the data that Robert Linquanti found, we're also lowering the expectation from standards met to almost, so to the midpoint of almost. So we're hoping to pick up a few students that, that didn't qualify now that would now qualify um, next year. This is complicated stuff. Yeah. I mean, I've sat through a lot of these presentations <laughs> and I'm confused. No doubt. I mean, I get it mostly, right. but I am confused. So when will you bring back the actual data? So you're just telling us that this is what the changes are in terms of assessing and evaluating kids who right. are with a new tool and, right? That's, right. What, that's all yeah. this is. Yeah. Um, and congratulations that the guru <laughs> pointed to PBUSD right. and your right. work. So right. that's great. Proud of you. Um, so you will come back, though, and share the data with us yeah. at some point. The students are concluding LPAC for this year. And so the, the, the LPAC numbers that we're getting or the reclassification numbers that we're getting are based on last year's cut scores, which are now different than the current cut scores for the assessment that they are currently taking. So next year we will be able to give you the updated numbers on reclassification for the current recommendations of cut scores. And for yes, the we're gonna bring back data for you. And for the viewing <laughs> public, why is it important to reclassify these kids? Um, uh, data shows that, that students perform much better academically um, when they're reclassified. And, and that's, that's kind of the uh, what we're showing here. The there was um, an acronym up there I did, I think I missed. I don't know if you said it. Our, our Reclassified Fluent English Proficient. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Good job. Thank you. What I don't understand is that we're voting on this even though, explain to me what we're voting on exactly because obviously we don't have any information yet. We're kind of waiting to see what's gonna happen and you know, what he's showing us is, you know, it's what's going to be even a little bit harder for our students to reclassify, whatever. But we're now voting on it. Yes. So we, as was mentioned prior last year, because we did not have the LPAC scores, we were allowed or required to do an interim um, reclassification criteria. Now that we've received direction from the state, and we have the first set of LPAC scores, we must now align to the required state requirements. Okay. So we have to adopt this reclassification criteria so that when our new SPAC scores come in, we can reclassify another set of students. If we do not, our interim um, reclassification criteria is now invalid or will be invalid because we're now required to adhere to the new state recommendations. So what we're bringing you tonight is, yes, we don't have data on it yet, but we will, but we d won't be able to have data on it unless we approve the new reclassification criteria. Okay, I get it. Okay, everybody get it? <laughs> One thing that Robert um, explained to us at BCN was that um, there is a process that the state is going through with the end goal hopefully in um, 2022 that the, they're actually gonna just take away, they're gonna make a recommendation hopefully and it might be just having one criteria, not having all four. Um, but, but, but what we're hoping is to create a criteria that we can use until then. I'd like to make a motion to approve the um, interim criteria for reclassification. Second. Well, okay, but any, we don't have any public speakers and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Oh, sorry, I thought we were already on. No, 10.1, you're approving it, aren't you? Approving 10.1? Okay, so now we're doing an action item and this is a 10.1 where we're approving the, the, the new data that we're gonna be 
Lindsay. Okay, so I make a motion to a approve. Yeah. Why? She just opened it. Yeah. And we just heard the discussion. Yeah. Is there anything no, no. else that no, I'm missing? No, 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 no much discussion. Like no, 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 you can do it. You can do it. Okay. okay. So my motion stands. I'd like to make a motion to approve the interim criteria for reclassification. I second your motion. There you go. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 601. Thank you. <laughs> okay, 10.2, classroom supplies. This one's a good one. As for certificated staff, presented by Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, so thank you. So we're actually going to do quite a few people are going to speak to this item. I'm briefly going to open it up. I'm going to pass it off to um, to Trustee Orozco, and then we will bring it to um, to um, Rich. Will be doing it. He'll need it. Um, um, we'll be Mr. Arellano will be bringing it um, to some of the details. So uh, several now almost um, close to eight months ago. Um, this original conversation was brought up. Um, we, as a former classroom teacher of over a decade, we all know that as a classroom teacher, we often invest some significant funds into, into, our, um, into our classroom. Um, unfortunately, unlike most um, professions, it's almost expected of us to do because it's kind of um, something that we do. And um, so there was a conversation come, that came up that was what can we do in order to support um, certificated staff? So uh, the reason why Maria is going to speak to it a bit is she never let it die. I think every time that, um, because it was not an easy process to figure out something um, that we could do that um, that we it was allowed with the funds, but almost every, probably every one-on-one um, -on -one that I had with her, she'd say, where are we at with the classroom supplies for the certificated staff? So um, she definitely um, should be um, provided support on on this one because she was the engine behind um, behind the motor. So um, I will leave it to Maria to say a few more words. Cool. Um, I just have a comment. <laughs> um, I think for some time now, teachers, you know, at different points in time, at least for the past six years have expressed some concern around having to pay for materials um, out of pocket. And in many instances, they've even had to ask parents for donations at school sites. So my hope in bringing this item forward is to provide some assistance for our teachers um, who are buying materials to enrich the classroom experience for our students and in return support their success. And while I recognize that this stipend will not cover all expenditures, uh, it will provide some help and serve as a token of our appreciation for all they do for our students. And so tonight I am asking, after the presentation of course, for my colleagues to support me in moving this item forward. I think our teachers are deserving of this stipend um, and, um, and hopefully it can be something that it's done in an annual basis. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Uh, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. My name's Rich Ariano. I'm the Director of Purchasing. And I'm just gonna quickly cover some of the program highlights for teachers for this initiative. Um, the district's role in the process and then Palace's role in the process. I also have Todd Trowbridge with me. He's the uh, Regional Vice President for Palace and he's got some information to share on the initiative as well. So. Um, First, the program highlight for teachers. Um, each participating staff member will receive a uh, unique purchase order with their name and PO number on it. Um, all staff will be issued the same amount. Um, the PO can be used online or in one of Palace's retail stores for their supplies. Online orders that they place will be delivered direct to their school site and to their attention. And then um, for use in store, a PO must be carried into the store and um, we'll get into Palace's role on, on how that helps um, the entire process. Um, so for us in the district, our role will be, um, to be clear, these are not going to be gifts of funds in, in any way. Each PO will be processed through our, our financial system and um, go through our approval process. Invoices will be generated for every purchase that they make, so our accounts payable team will get um, a report back on 
the amount that they spent and the items that they purchased. And then school sites will be trained and supported by um, our purchasing staff to create these purchase orders for every school site. So that'll be training and um, support if it's, a, if it's a school site that has a lot of teachers and they get overwhelmed with trying to get this done, we can probably quickly uh, help them get those ordered. And then, oh, sorry. And then um, Palace's uh, role in this process uh, so cost control, they already do a great job with us, um, with all of our supply, POs that we process through them with um, making sure that we do not overspend. Um, accurate invoicing and reporting of expenses, they've done a great, also done a great job working with our accounts payable team to uh, create a fluid system for that. Uh, training is available to either um, go out to sites and help teachers navigate the online portal and then um, most of the items that would be ordered online would be delivered next day to our sites. Um, so that's my piece. And then I'm going to turn it over to Todd. And then if there's any questions. So say how stuff. much they're getting. Um, I want to make sure. Yeah, I want to make sure. Yeah. Um, so it'll be $125 per teacher. And it's um, um, the uh, board item has the groups that are included and some of the groups that are not. Yeah. But it'll be 125 um, across the board. Mm -hmm. Madam President, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, I first want to say thank you from Palace for being a partner with us uh, for almost 25 years. And uh, you guys have helped pave the way um, for school district business uh, for Palace, but also pave the way for what it should look like with a partnership. And we want to thank you for that. I um, want to thank you for the opportunity we have to be here tonight to be a part of this, um, of honoring your teachers. Um, just a little bit of uh, details on our side. What we have done is we're going to take our uh, school contracts that are pre-negotiated with the purchasing department um, that you guys have voted on, and those will be extended to your teachers as well. So they'll be able to get as much as possible for that $125. Um, they will also, which is not something we've done before, but we are extending those discounts. It'll be about 2,200 items um, that they can go into the store as well. And usually we don't give that deep of a discount in the store on POs, but because of the um, opportunity here and the connection with you guys, we see it as a great opportunity to be able to do that. Um, I have spent a lot of time over the past year or um, year and a half training folks online to get them online, working with Imelda, working with Helen and Colleen to make sure that things are smooth and the PO tracking is done correctly because that's a big deal. We want to make sure that we honor every dollar that is spent with us. Um, and so the, with these POs, and it's a lot of work, uh, with almost, I think it was almost 2,000 um, POs will need to be cut. Um, but we are willing to track those um, and work with uh, both your uh, finance department and your purchasing department to make sure that it's done well and that the dollars are accounted for and the products are accounted for. So again, thank you for the opportunity. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. No comments. Okay. We have Bill Beecher speaking. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, at first blush, this gives teachers a chance to save on the money that they've been spending out of their own pockets for classroom supplies. I call it a feel-good action. It implies that the district is providing the fundamental supplies that are needed by each teacher and that these funds are to cover those extra needs that each teacher has. I challenge that premise. I know that an insufficient number of pencils and erasers are being distributed to our schools. I personally, for the last several years, have been supplying over 2,100 <coughs> pencils and erasers to four of our elementary schools because they just don't get them. Now, how did I, why did I start doing this? Well, I was attending site councils, and I heard this in the site councils. And for those of you who've been on the board, we heard many teachers get up during the, we need wages in, uh, increased. And one of the reasons was, we have to take money out of our own pockets to buy supplies. Well, it seems to me that the teachers who should receive this kind of help from this action item are the science and art teachers where their needs are distinctly different than the average teacher. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Because you just you don't buy the stuff that they need. This proposal does not discuss whether the present system adequately supplies the needed common supplies, which is best handled through central purchasing for the best pricing. Therefore, I would suggest that the board send this back for further consideration. I believe a hybrid approach is what you'll end up with. You need to fix the old system, which wasn't adequately supplying supplies in the first place. And there's no discussion about that tonight. Why aren't we fixing that first? And then you do have extra money for teachers who have specific special needs, like science and art teachers. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, for Maria, for all your years on the board, and thank you for bringing this up for teachers. And I just also appreciate that we're utilizing a local business. So um, actually, I was going to bring up Mr. Beecher's point. Um, what exactly are we doing for our teachers with initial supplies in the classroom? Mm -hmm. Um, if that's, I understand it might need to be looked at and brought back and that, and that is fine, but I'd like to know um, what exactly are we providing each classroom with? And I appreciate this gesture. I know Maria has worked on this for a while and I know that the teachers could really use this. So a couple of things. One, I think that it is not, um, it is not across the board how, P how the school sites use their discretionary funds. So that's one because the school site council dictates what the site does with their discretionary funds. Um, two, though, I will say we swipe more than a million dollars of discretionary funds each year from the sites. So to me, the premise that we do not have the funds at the sites to purchase basic supplies does not, well, it, it isn't, it's, I don't believe that's factual. I think do we need to, in which we have been doing through the new budget um, process that just started this year, but we've been, starting this year, we started to talk to the principals about where is your remaining funding, where should you be spending your remaining funding. Um, so for me, I think it's about um, efficient and effective use of funding because since I've been here, every single year we have retaken back over a million dollars from sites, which doesn't say to me that sites don't have the funding that they need. Is there a system in place where we actually see, I mean, I've looked at the general, but for each school, is there an accountability for what they are yeah. uh, purchasing? So each, so each school site has a single plan for student achievement. And in the single plan for student achievement, they line out, and it's it's um, approved by their school site council, they line out how they're spending all their funds. So on each single plan for student achievement, we would be able to see how they're allocating those funds. Um, and then, and, and it is not the same across the board. So um, like Ann Soldo this past year, they did something kind of similar to what we're doing right now. Um, district-wide where they gave each one um, high schools in general are a little bit more similar because they give amounts to departments and really on the urging of trustee Deserpa, we had some conversations regarding science last year um, the art teachers and the science teachers which um, for the most part are pullout teachers they do receive separate funding so when you look at the district LCAP um, you actually will see the funding supplies um, for specifically our science teachers and our art teachers. So they already have a different pot of money through supplemental and concentration funds that we're using for their supplies. So regarding art and um, science, are the, do, you, do we feel as an administration that the money that's supplied to them is adequate for their needs? Because, uh, you know, I'm not trying to, like, this is not a gotcha comment. I'm just a parent on a campus going to back to school night, and, you know, we're still being asked for a multitude of 
supplies to support those classrooms, including Kleenex and Purell and, you know, that those kind of supplies. And then, you know, you know what they want is Palace, um, you know. Things. So I'm sure that Susan can speak a little bit more to this, but we have this year alone asked three separate times what specific supplies do you need, and we will get you every single supply that you need. So in the case of the science, if they do not have it, it is because although we have asked, and we have gone to see the little, the little whites of their eyes to say, hey, what do you need? Um, so Rob Hoffman has gone um, site by site and asked for it. Um, so I feel very specific. We have, even though that was out there, um, Change is hard. So you always ask for something. It's hard to change the mantra of we always yeah. ask for things. Um, and, you know, some of them this won't solve. So some of the things that they ask for donations for are things like consumables that are like milk, eggs, things that they aren't going to be able to get at Palace. Um, Palace was really one of the only partners that would do the high level of work that we're asking them to do. We're asking them to do 1,200 POs. Most school, most uh, most businesses that we ask that from, they were like, no way. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to solve all of the problems of what teachers want um, because they're not going to be able to go to um, Safeway and get milk that they need or vinegar that they need, right? Um, but it's um, it's a step in what we're trying to do. So um, I have served b both on site councils and um, in parent groups. And um, at Valencia, we we were able to raise significant amounts of money because we have incorporated into a nonprofit, and so we were able to give um, like I think it was three hundred dollars per um, teacher for supplies. Um, but the truth is, is that the teachers rarely used that gift because of the red tape that it took to make it work. And, and I don't know if that was like a district thing or whatever. So um, I, what I heard you say is that this is going to be hopefully a seamless process. People could go online. I know I'll, myself, like I don't really love online shopping. I like to go and look at stuff. So um, I'm hoping this this will work in a way that is meaningful for the teachers and not, not to not not b a lot of barriers in place we um one of the things that we had talked about is we had talked about trying to make it as seamless and normal as possible uh, and so we went with the idea of the po sheets so the teachers were already used to having a po sheet that they would take into our store um, and then use there or they can use it online which like i said i spent a lot of time training online and rich has asked me to get more people online um, and so i continue to work to do that and so we were our hope is that it will be as seamless as possible. Um, there's gonna be speed bumps. Um, we're gonna hit some rocks in the road, but our goal is to make it as seamless as possible for them so that they can spend that money. Thank you for being willing to do that. And um, I give you a lot of personal business. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Spend a lot of money at your place. <laughs> I'll make a motion. I think or actually, do you want to make the motion, Maria? Can I? Didn't yeah. you make a motion? No, Maria? Maria's going to make it. Okay. <laughs> I would like to make a motion to approve this item. I'll second. <coughs> okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Six zero one. Thank you. <coughs> okay. This is a item which we're going to vote, and it's already been discussed discussed with us so I'm hoping there's not a lot of conversation from the board there's no public speakers right yeah so um, this was the sunshine proposal is there any discussion from the board no. okay <laughs> can I have a motion move approval second. second okay all those in favor aye, aye. 601 okay resolution 10.4 <coughs> adult education week 18, 1932, what does that mean? Number 18, 1932. Nancy Bilicic, is she here? Yes. Oh, she's still here. She's here, you're here. <laughs> I'm not sure you were here or not. <laughs> you're always here. <laughs> I didn't know if I was gonna speak to this item. 
<laughs> but as you know, um, Adult Education Week is uh, April 8th through the 12th. And we um, are going to be taking a trip to Sacramento to meet with our representatives and talk to them about adult education and funding and all those great things. And so it would be really nice to have a proclamation on behalf of the district to take with us. We have one, right? Yes. <laughs> you have it, yes. it's in the packet. Yeah, oh. we have a resolution. Okay. We have a resolution, I read it, I read it. I don't need to read it. I think you have it. No, okay. I read. We read okay, it. Good. Yes, really good. Okay. Any public speakers? Any discussion from the board? Resolutions are always great. Okay. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks for doing a great job, Nancy. Yeah, Nancy. Thank, thank you. you. Well, no, thank you for the support. Thank you. No, it means it makes a little big difference. Continue to support you. Okay. Great. <laughs> Okay, 10.5, and this is with you too, my dear. Well, these are the um, annual- Santa Cruz pens, SoCal pens, Westside pens. Right, okay. the, yeah. the um, parent school, the nursery schools that we have in Santa Cruz. Um, the parent groups have decided to operate them. So we have an MOU that we had last year, and this is another MOU for the future. Just pretty standard, it was approved last year. Okay, no public speakers. Okay, any discussion from the board? Okay, all those in favor? I mean, I, no, I like no. I have to have a second, I have to have first and second. Oh. I'll have to make a motion. Uh, I do have a question, actually. Okay. Sure. So just for uh, the public, uh -huh. what is the difference between what you're presenting tonight versus what we approved a while back? Th this is the same that you, the same MOU, except there is not a monetary figure in this one because it was a one-time fee that we gave to the pens to operate. Um, the parents want to operate these schools and they do it a little bit differently than we do our Watsonville co-op. So as long as they're fiscally there, we're letting them do it. And it's, so this is the exact same document except the monetary part is not there this year. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, for motion. So moved. I'll, I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. Okay, 10.6, NWEA map proposal for addition of charters. Okay, so what are we doing with that now? This is by Susan Perez. Did I have it on, not on? Okay. Good evening, members of the board. Um, President Osmondson, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, I wanna say two months ago, um, we were asked to gather information about what it would take to include charter school map scores with our map reports and to bring that information back to you. Um, so I have done the research and um, Basically, I'm going to walk you through um, what would be involved. To start with, um, we have been using MAP in this district. This is our third year. We've done a number of presentations on MAP, but just as a reminder, it is an interim assessment that is provided uh, three times a year that we use with our students. It measures growth over time, not only within a year, but throughout the time that a student is in our district. Um, so it's a very valuable tool for us. Teachers can use it um, to plan, it, it basically tells teachers what students are ready to learn next. And so teachers can plan grouping, we can um, set up interventions based on this. It's proven to be a very valuable tool. Um, it does project proficiency. It tells us how uh, students are likely to do on state tests at the end of the year, and it also gives an indication in fifth grade and above of a student's um, likely success on state, on um, college entrance, the ACT. And they're working on SAT. So currently, PVUSD has a contract, um, and the amount there is indicated. 
Alianza Charter already has a contract, and their amount is on the slide, and Watsonville Charter School of the Arts already has a contract. So my question to the company was really twofold. How much would it cost if we brought the charters in to our contract and added Pacific Coast Charter because there were three charter schools that, that were wanting to participate? And then is it due of what would be involved in the migration of the data into our contract? And what about our windows because they don't necessarily differ? What would be the challenges with that? So um, basically, these, the amount in sort of the yellow color would be the additional cost to our contract. So you can see the amounts for Alianza, Wixa, and PCCS, a total of just over $12,000, bringing our contract up to um, just over $198,000. So a slight, an increase in cost to bring them on board. The migration process of taking the scores from Alianza and Wixa is doable, it means that for two weeks, those two schools cannot have access to their data um, while the migration process takes place, but all their prior scores would be available in our system, um, and the recommendation in talking to NWEA, MAP, and the principals is that that takes place in the summer. Um, the challenging part is, would be the windows. Um, WIXA has this pretty much the same testing window as um, we do as a district. Alianza had quite a different um, window, but in talking to the principal um, and her desire to have more transparency and have their scores reflected with ours, she talked to the staff and they agreed they would move their window to match the district window. So at this point in time, I think we have removed all challenges, and if you do um, approve the additional um, $12,000 $420, I believe it was, we can move forward and have um, those three schools added to our contract and, be, and do the migration this summer so that their scores can be in, our rep in the regular reports next year. So I can try to address any questions if you have any. So so since um, Watsonville Charter School for the Arts and Alianza had their own contract, I just need to understand a little tiny bit better. I, I, can, I can understand Pacific Coast Charter wanting to be in it, but um, the purpose of, of spending more money when they have their own contracts and putting them in our contract would be just, would be. It was at board request that we include charter data when we do our reports, uh, when we share our MAP scores with you, which we do several times a year after we've done our assessment windows, we did not include charters in the yeah. scores uh -huh. because if you're not, we didn't have access to their scores because yeah. they weren't part of our contract, yeah. and when the window isn't the same, you can't compare the data. Yeah. It, we would be comparing apples and oranges. No, the, I mean the window was very, Alianza's mm -hmm. especially, right? Yes. Okay, so it's important for, it's good for us or important for us to be able to share their scores when we share our data because it, what, helps our data look a little bit better or what? Well, they're our students. <laughs> yeah, no, no, they are. No, you know, and those, those, those charters are Can our I speak to that charters. really quick? So, because um, this was my request, Mr. Nickton, I think a couple of their, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's primarily because I think over the past years, at least since I've been here, we've never really been inclusive of our dependent charter schools. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's one. And then two, um, when PCCS came to present, they really had no data or any system in place that really tracked their student progress, yeah, right? They so they are our students, so if we're doing this assessment for one population to ensure that we are um, being able to identify the areas of need of growth, but then also track our students' strengths, I think we should be doing it for all students across the district, and that was not happening. Because I'm just asking of the, we're paying a little And we're <laughs> currently paying, the district's already currently paying for WICSA 
and Alianza. So it's not the only oh, you change are? would be the um, right? OK. Yeah. Yeah, so, so very similar to Nod, what happened with Aptos High and Navianza. So Na Aptos High was the first one to start Navianza. When we went district wide, we reimbursed Navi we reimbursed Aptos High, and we started a district wide contract. Okay. So that is what would happen in this case: is we would, um, we would. I don't think this year actually. But we would, would be next year. We would, we would just, they wouldn't have to pay for it now. So they would have a little bit extra funds. But especially when it comes to Wixa and Alianza, um, they are doing, especially Wixa is doing some really great work. Yeah. So being able to highlight best practices, that's been a common trend yeah. with the board is where are we doing some of our best work and how can we capitalize on that? Mm -hmm. The only way we can do that and do comparisons is if we're all doing the same period. I am very um, happy that Alianza decided to change the window because right. originally they did not want to and that was going to mean we were gonna have to exclude them. So I appreciate that the principal went back to the staff and decided to align it because then now they can benchmark themselves against Freedom, which is our other dual immersion school, and they can see how yeah. are they doing in comparison yeah. with others. Yeah, okay. I would like to add all three principals were very happy about this and eager to be able to compare with other schools. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, s I'm, I'm totally satisfied. Anything, Dean? Okay, any more comments? Okay, motion. Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, this is a long <laughs> discussion, I mean, long report in, the, in, in our Chromebook. 10.7 Watsonville Prep School Proposition 39 Facilities Request Preliminary Offer. Uh, good evening, Board President, members of the Board, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this uh, item is to uh, review um, our Prop 39 uh, process, uh, and in your Board Agenda item is for Watsonville Prep, and the location is at EA Hall. And just wanted to kind of take a step back and just uh, confirm to the Board that we did follow our Prop th Proposition 39 process. In order for uh, charters to be eligible for facilities, a charter school must have a valid charter petition uh, submitted and in place no later than March 15th. Um, and the other component has a projected in-classroom uh, average daily attendance of more than 80 students. And in this case, um, a navigator was, to, was able to provide both of them. And during this process, there also the district uh, for this facility request by November 1st of the year preceding um, and the district making a preliminary offer by February 1st, which we did. Uh, the charter school must provide a response uh, by March 1st, which was this month. And then the district's obligation is to provide a final offer uh, by April 1st. Um, and we are in that timeline right now. Uh, once the uh, uh, agreement is agreed upon, uh, facilities would be furnished and equipped and made available to the charter at least 10 days uh, before the start of the academic year. And this approval this evening allows us to take the necessary steps to make those facilities in preparation for uh, first day of school. Um, so we are working with um, Watsonville Prep in the preparation of uh, the uh, seven portables at EA Hall. And we are also looking at fencing um, that was one of the concerns from both um, entities is making sure that we had um, student uh, safety and um, the ability to, uh, to separate the older children from the younger children. Um, also uh, accessibility to the campus and making sure that the portables um, were accessible to the community and parents and had a, a drop off zone, um, but where they had um, direct access to the uh, Navigator Watsonville prep site. So with that being said, if you look on to your attachment, you see the facility use agreement that outlines in Appendix A. It actually gives you a map of EA Hall, and it shows you specifically uh, where those portables are located um, and where the, um, we also came to an agreement 
Initially, we have um, eight portables, but we're, uh, the plan was to demolish and uh, send back the portables that were not district owned. We continue to work on submitting um, to, there's one portable that we currently lease, so we are still continuing to return that to um, the leasing company. Uh, because of that, there's also an opportunity, uh, because of the age of the children, was a restroom facility. And so on the map, you'll see that initially we proposed either where the uh, current eight portable was at or near this street uh, curb to install a modular restroom uh, building. And we came to an agreement with Watsonville Prep to relocate that more into an interior space uh, adjacent to the portables for one visibility and student safety and accessibility. Um, we also, um, if agreed upon, uh, the additional cost would be incurred by Watsonville Prep. Um, so that's the overall layout. Um, and it also provides, with the additional fencing on the top left corner, um, some green play field space as well for the children. Um, so we have that available. Um, and that kind of summarizes the item as a whole. Yes, we have Kevin Sved. Um, good evening, President Osmundson, uh, board members, Superintendent Rodriguez. I'm Kevin Sved. I'm the CEO of Navigator Schools. We operate, or will operate, Wattsville Prep School. Um, we're really thankful for all the hard work of the staff um, to provide appropriate facilities for the Watsonville Prep students. As you know, um, Watsonville, or I should say, uh, Pajaro Valley uh, Unified residents have priority enrollment for Watsonville Prep School, and right now we're getting pretty close to conducting our lottery, and all but a couple students are non-PVUSD residents, so we do anticipate nearly 100% of our student body will be Pajaro Valley Unified uh, School District residents. Um, we do want to invite you to our upcoming lottery. Um, we can provide more details, but it's going to be on Saturday, April 13th at the YWCA, and we can get you more details in case you are interested. Um, the lottery is a completely random um, lottery, um, again, taking into account the priority for uh, Watsonville and then also for uh, Pajaro Valley Unified. And we look forward later to invite you to, if you approve this action item tonight, to invite you to our small corner of the campus that will be located at the A Hall uh, site. And we are projecting a uh, first day of school as August 14th. Did I get that right? August 13th. <laughs> so again, we just thank you uh, for the staff um, and the board for uh, taking your time to provide appropriate facilities for the students of Watsonville Prep. Thank you so much. Okay, question from the board. Just have one. Um, can I? Yeah. Uh, so I know that uh, Navigator Schools um, is also considering renting out the Porter Building in downtown Watsonville. If they were to reach um, an agreement with the city of Watsonville, will, will they be held to this contract or would we be able to cancel altogether? So if uh, negotiations, um, and, and it's my understanding negotiations are ongoing with the city, and maybe Kevin can speak a little bit to that, but if negotiations are successful and continue and they find another uh, location, then there is some language here that both entities can withdraw from this agreement, um, and so that is an option. So if another facility does open up for them, they can choose to withdraw. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, I just, I just wanted. I, I thought at one point that they did, you know, request things that we decided, you know, we're not able to provide them. There, w there was some things that they requested of us. Correct. Correct. I, I would say one example. Um, well, one thing that we, we was a nice surprise is we were looking at IT infrastructure and uh, Navigator Watsonville Prep is looking to bring in their own infrastructure. Uh, so that was something that we came to agreement on. 
Another component that was requested that we look into was nutrition services uh, and providing uh, lunch services. We are providing the cafeteria for lunch services, but as far as the service itself, that is something we didn't have the capacity uh, to do. Um, another area that we worked on together and we will finalize is making sure the bell schedule is not conflicting. Um, so that'll also provide um, making sure when they do use the cafeteria that our um, the older students, they're not in with the younger students. So those are examples of things that we've worked out. Okay. Um, so I guess we can vote on this. 10.7. Um, any motions? A motion? <laughs> Regretfully, I will make a motion to proceed with the offer of facili facilities or the, is it the preliminary request? Is that what it's called? Correct. Okay. And the, yeah, preliminary offer. Second. I'll be there later. Did we have a second? Did I get a second? Who, oh, I thought you just second. Anyone want a second? I will. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Did everybody say vote in favor? Okay. Okay, six. Zero one. 10.8, and on these issues here, I'd like, if we can, have no discussion whatsoever and just vote really quickly. <laughs> can we do that? <laughs> You're gonna have, you wanna have discussion on each of them? Yeah, I don't know. Second, second read, oh, your second yeah. read. You've already had the first read. Michael, is Michael coming up? <laughs> oh, I'm hoping to. Ceremonial last time. <laughs> Well, yeah, so yeah, so that's true, that's true. We, we've done well, we've done really well. Okay, is there public speakers? No. Okay, second read, update to BP 5145.13, response to immigration. Any discussion from the board? I thought we had a, a pretty good, I thought we had a pretty good policy on, um, on this to begin with and it seems like th there's a lot of red here that has been um, passed down to us from the state. Did our own policy differ this much or this is just extra language? So the Attorney General's guidance from the feds, from the federal government, is what all the red is. All the policies that we did that had anything to do with citizenship or immigration all covered the spirit of, and they were from the CSBA. That was from the state recommendations. What the reviewer finally said is, I know you have it all in there in the spirit, but we can't, we can't recognize the CSBA. We need the feds. And I, so I said, so you need it word for word. And he said, yeah. No more discussion. <laughs> Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Ten point nine. Second read. AR five one four five point nine. Hate <laughs> motivating or motivate behavior. <coughs> yeah. Any discussion? Okay, can I have a motion? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 10.10, .10, second read, BPAR 6020, parent and family engagement. Discussion. <laughs> can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Thank we're you very much. doing good. <laughs> okay, um, so on the consent agenda, the only thing I would say is congratulations to Kathy Lathrop <laughs> for getting um, the block grant 
and it's for 82,500 um, for the quality rating and improvement system for all preschool sites. And they have received score four, which is the highest score our preschools that you can ever receive. You should click. Okay. No public speakers, right? Um, I have a question about two items. Items. Okay. You want to defer them? You want to defer them? Uh, it, it's just, yeah, it's just a comment. Oh. You have to defer them. You have to defer them. Okay, if I could just briefly pull 11.8 and 11.9 for just a question. 11.8 and 11.9. Okay, so we, 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 I, I, I have a motion to approve our consent agenda with the deferral of 11.8 and 11.9. Under 12.0. Second. Second. We have three seconds. <laughs> okay. Three seconds are good. <laughs> the deferred items. Go ahead. I just had a quick no. question on both 11.8 and 11.9. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry. So Sorry, there Danny. is a first and three seconds. Sorry. Call for a vote. Oh, I have to call for a vote yeah. before yeah. I can do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Call for a vote. Um, Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. okay. Now, now for now deferral. We, yeah. Now it's 12.0. Yeah. Perfect. So for 11.8, um, just as I was reading it, I was reading about this district has an architect pool. And my question was how many architects are in this pool and what is this pool exactly? Facilities person has to talk. Oh, maybe, All right, so for 11.8, uh, this is uh, Sugimura Finney Architects and the project is um, for the item, the Prop 39. Um, no. The question was how much, how much pool architects we have, whether the pool architects and the architects are in the pool. This is, <coughs> yeah, I just wanted to make sure. This is one architect, and we have a pool of six architects uh, within the district. Um, and once one of them gets pulled out of the, I guess, the hat, I mean, do we keep going to the same pool, or is these are these architects different, or does this pool ever change, or is it the six same architects? Um, to establish the pool of architects, what the district uh, did this year is we completed uh, in partnership with facilities and uh, our procurement process. We developed an RFP, and we released that throughout the state of California. And I think we sent that out for approximately 60 days, and we got numerous response responses from that RFP. And then out of that process, the six firms were selected. Um, each were assigned um, through our bond projects. The, the work or projects were redistributed to the six uh, architectural firms. Uh, this one, uh, for specific to this project, was an urgent item because of the deadline that we have to hit for the upcoming um, deadline. Um, but we have our director of facilities, uh, Victor Sandoval here, that can also assist with the questions. But that was the um, how this architect was uh, assigned this project, um, and then we rotate the work. So all the projects have been redistributed uh, to the remaining architects in the pool. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't the same six just sitting in the same pool. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so we're voting on the deferrals, right? Okay, we're voting 11.8, what, in the 11 point? Yeah, so we're voting on 11.8 and 11.9. So point of order, can we vote on both of those together or separate? Yeah, separate. Okay. separate, okay. 11.8, all those in favor? We need a motion oh, and motion, a second. motion, sorry. That's okay. Move to approve. So second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 11.9. Move motion. approval. Second. <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I wasn't going to make a comment. So we're going to just move. We don't have any. Ex we don't have any expulsion. So you, it's just yours, Danny, for the closed session consent. Uh, just the motion number one out of closed session item two point two. I move to approve the certificated personal report as presented by district administration on March twenty seventh, twenty nineteen with 112 and, and 11 additional action items as well as one correction. Second.
All those in favor? Aye. 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 A motion number two, closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district and administration on March 27, 2019 with 46 and 82 additional action items. 77 of the additional action items are for yard duty employees, now part of the classified service per assembly bill 2160. Yeah. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And there's more. Yeah, we need a readout on 2.6, which had um, a 6-0 vote. Yeah, we, already, so so we need a board member to read out 2.6. Okay, um, we're going to vote on 2.6, a ratification of a workers' compensation claim, 5106880138. And we're voting on it, right? No, we already voted. Yeah, yeah. oh, because, uh, and, and that's not, and that's the only thing, right? That there okay. is a 6 0 vote. Yeah, it was a 6, six 0 vote. I think it's April, it's gonna be the April, April 10th. 10th. It's a special board meeting. We're going to have a special board meeting on April 10th. It's, it's gonna be on the brown. Well, it's on a couple of different things. Okay, we're gonna, we're, our special board meeting is gonna be on the Brown Act and we're also gonna deal with an appeal. Adjourn. So what is all this?